Hello everyone, Dr. Bob here. I know you're not used to seeing me here at the start of videos, but that's because today we have an extremely pressing matter to attend to, one that cuts to the deepest core of one of the SCP Foundation's deadliest contained anomalies, SCP-096, The Shy Guy. It's a creature that needs no introduction, because it probably haunts all of your nightmares already. Close your eyes and picture it in your mind's eye, that gaunt face with the slack jaw and the lifeless white eyes. The face you hope never to see as long as you live. The pale skin pulled tight against bone, those impossibly long, gangly limbs. It sits there in its airtight containment cube, covering its face and quietly sobbing, always sobbing, as though cursing something beyond even its own understanding. Perhaps, when thinking about SCP-096, you feel a pang of sympathy mixed with the terror. After all, this anomaly is no sadist. Why would a sadist cry as it kills, like SCP-096 does? You're not alone in asking this question. I've spent many a night poring over classified files with an ever-freshening pot of coffee, trying to piece together the answers. SCP-096 is considered one of the most dangerous Euclid-class creatures in containment, and yet, so little about it is known, beyond its capability to do great harm whenever someone is unlucky enough to see its face and send it into its rage state. How did this happen? It's a question for the curious, like you or me, and after months of strenuous research, I believe I may have an answer. Whether you choose to believe it is up to you. Just be warned when you hear what I believe to be the heartbreaking, tragic origin of this terrifying and pitiful monster, you may never be able to look at him the same way again. Not that looking at him should ever be high on your list of priorities. It begins in a tavern in a small Nepalese village a few miles away from the Chinese border, where Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain above sea level, waits. Its mere existence is like a challenge to the brave and foolhardy. Conquer me, it seems to whisper. Conquer me and declare yourself above all those I have conquered. Become a god among men. It's always whispering like this, but few, in the grand scheme of things, can actually hear it. And sadly for him, the explorer is among those few. He's sitting in one of the tavern's many cozy nooks, picking away at a plate of mutton curry while sipping from a brass bowl of white chiang, a popular local drink. The explorer, living up to his name, has come a long way to get here. The rest of the village locals in the tavern eye him with a variety of knowing glances. They've seen so many like him before, smug smiles and puffed chests, thinking they'll be able to count themselves among the exalted few who've conquered the mountain to end all mountains. The bodies of many men like this are still frozen to the mountain's surface. One brave local, an older man who can speak English fluently, slides in across the table from the explorer. The old-timer tells him that whatever he thinks he'll find up on the mountain, honor, glory, recognition, he'd be better off searching for it elsewhere. Death awaits on the icy rocks above. The explorer, young, fit, and still feeling mighty smug, replies that death is there for the people who haven't worked hard enough, who haven't prepared. He's scaled other mountains before, all across the globe, from Scotland to Peru. Everest would hold no surprises for him, just a new, compelling challenge. The old man is, as you could probably imagine, unamused by the explorer's hubris. All confidence and bluster now he says with his thin, raspy voice. But what will you say when you are face to face with the king? The explorer, assuming that this king refers to the mountain itself, <laughs> smiles and replies, I'll ask him for his crown. With that, the old man leaves, content that he at least tried to dissuade the explorer from going on this doomed journey. If nothing else, his conscience would be clear now. He had done all that he possibly could. The explorer, not bothered by the grim prophecies of superstitious locals, finishes his curry and chung and retires to the room he rented upstairs. He's so excited. Tomorrow, it will finally be time. All his months of training will pay off. He will climb to Mount Everest's peak. It would be an achievement to last a whole lifetime, one he would never ever forget, no matter how much he wants to. The next day, the tip of his ice axe cleaves into the mountainside as he grunts, strains, and pulls himself up another few feet. He's about 2,000 meters up, and every additional meter is fighting him. 
It's the bitterest cold he's ever known, a freeze so deep it makes his incredibly expensive thermal locking clothes feel like he's wearing wet, one-ply toilet paper. But the pain doesn't matter. The cold doesn't matter. He finds it exhilarating. Of course, just as the old man had warned, death could be waiting for him on this mountain. But the truth is, the explorer has never felt more alive. He winches himself up a few feet more, trying to regulate his breathing as his icy fingers, wrapped in thick gloves, struggle to find purchase on what feels like a sheer cliff face. There are many times when he's supporting his full body weight with only his hands. It often takes the kind of Herculean strength that only a lifetime of training can give you. After all, there's no room for error on Mount Everest. One wrong move, and you're either plummeting to your death or becoming a permanent frozen fixture of the mountainside. And because Everest is so dangerous, nobody comes to collect the bodies of dead mountaineering hopefuls. Their corpses, coated in often colorful winter jackets, litter the mountain. Some look at them as a tragic warning. Other, more morbid mountaineers use them as mile markers for their own more successful ascents. Whether the explorer would be lucky or become just another dead, frozen mile marker is still entirely up to chance. He climbs for a few more hours, pushing past his body's complaints, his physical limitations, until he reaches a well-earned plateau. Here, he establishes a small base camp and eats some of his rations. The area is thankfully guarded enough to keep out the worst of the sub-zero winds, so he can at least get some sleep without freezing to death. Mount Everest cannot be conquered today, and even someone with the explorer's bravado wouldn't dare to try. But as he settles down to sleep for the night, he can't help but look up and the enormity of what stands before him, he finds utterly terrifying. The mountain just keeps going and going and going, stretching up into the misty heavens, like the tip would only be a short jump from the moon. For the first time, the explorer begins to genuinely wonder, will I scale this mountain, or will I die on it? What he never even considers is that there may be a third option that's so, so much worse. Over the next few days, he keeps climbing further and further. Hundreds, then thousands of meters pass under him as he breaks past even the boundaries biology seemed to set for him. He's impossible to deter, an engine of pure, burning willpower, going because he knows he cannot stop. Because he knows that if he throws in the towel now, it will have all been for nothing. He'll be just another failure, one speck among billions. He'll have no meaning, no legacy. He'll just be another average Joe forgotten. And that honestly scares him even more than the prospect of freezing to death up here. Eventually, even though it costs him almost everything to do it, he reaches 8,000 meters, an area known as the Death Zone, where it's believed to be impossible for humans to acclimate. This is the thin, rarefied air that few have been permitted to breathe, and he's seen so many brightly colored mile markers on the way to here. The ground is slippery, and the air chews into the explorer's skin but he knows he's made it this far. Less than a thousand meters from the peak now, he has almost conquered the mountain. So you can only imagine how surprised he feels when he sees another mountaineer walking down the side of the mountain towards him with an eerie kind of casualness. He's wearing standard mountain climbing gear, including white thermal pants and a hooded coat zipped up to the chin. The explorer can't make out the stranger's face beyond the pair of thick, black goggles he's wearing over his eyes. What the hell is going on here? The second the stranger's eyes fall upon him, he feels a frightening sensation. The bite of the cold is gone. The chilling winds can't reach him. Instead, he feels warm, cozy, and content, like he's sitting in front of a warm fire in a well-insulated log cabin. In any other circumstance, these sensations might be welcomed, but a seasoned mountaineer knows that this is actually one of the worst things you can feel. It means that death is creeping in, and your body is opening the front door and welcoming it. And if this stranger is causing that feeling, then one thing is certain, he's bad news. The explorer wants to turn and run, but he finds that he can't. It's almost as though he's frozen in place, entranced by the warm, inviting feeling that the other mountaineer seems to exude as he gets closer and closer. That's when the explorer notices something strange about him. Something is glowing through his goggles, like hot embers, burning a bright, luminous orange. Are those eyes? Dear God, are those his eyes? The explorer can feel their terrible stare, literally feel it. It hurts to be looked at by this monster. 
Yes, that's what it is. A monster. A monster in the shape of a man. Why are you here, mortal? Comes a booming voice from the inhuman mountaineer. Do you wish to challenge me? The explorer can't form words. He's quaking, his body acknowledging the cold that his mind can't as those two glowing eyes bore into him. Speak, the stranger commands. Who? What? Are you? The explorer forces out between chattering teeth. The stranger laughs. I am the king of the mountain. Though to the SCP Foundation, he's better known as SCP-1529, and he's the worst possible thing you can run into while trying to scale Mount Everest. The explorer remembers his conversation with the old man in the tavern. The question he asked, what will you say when you're face to face with the king? And his own foolish answer, I'll ask him for his crown. Now, really, truly face to face with the king of the mountain, all the poor terrified explorer can do is whimper and beg for mercy. Please, he says, the tears freezing on his cheeks as they fall. I just wanted to climb. The king of the mountain gives another booming laugh, his eyes burning. Then you will climb, he says, and climb and climb and climb. The king of the mountain must have wielded truly unspeakable power to do what he does next. With a simple nod, the explorer is suddenly hanging off of the mountainside, his fingers digging into the craggy rocks, the only thing supporting his weight. It was like being back at square one all over again, except with added pain, terror, and cold so deep he can feel his bones rattling. And all the while, he feels those eyes upon him, those burning, fiery eyes, staring with absolute malice. He keeps climbing. Every time he reaches a plateau, a place where he might camp and find even momentary comfort, the king of the mountain is already waiting there, staring that horrible stare. And just like that, the explorer was climbing again, wind whipping against him like forty lashes from a cat of nine tails. That, coupled with the endless strain of the climb on his muscles, is the worst agony he's ever felt. And yet, he never dies. Even though he hasn't eaten in days, weeks, months, years, he never ever dies. He just fulfills the same torturous loop over and over again. It's like the king of the mountain is just keeping him alive for his own amusement, a toy that's impossible to break. But while the explorer never breaks, as time goes on and the torments never cease, he does begin to change, like rock being molded by the tide. First from the endless stress, his hair falls out, his skin goes pale from the lack of sun, his body becomes thin and wiry from starvation and malnourishment, the endless physical strain even warps his limbs, his arms and legs begin to stretch, his body becoming elongated and grotesque. All the way through this horrific, dehumanizing ordeal, the king of the mountain stares at him. One day, the explorer, now changed, reaches a plateau, and as can be expected, the king of the mountain stares at him with his burning eyes. The explorer cowers and covers his face with his hands, sobbing from exhaustion. He just wants the king of the mountain to look away, to leave him be. He babbles incoherently. He doesn't want to be seen anymore. His pain simply makes the king of the mountain laugh. I gave you your wish, the mountain king says, his voice oozing with contempt. You climbed, didn't you? You thought that your climbing would elevate you, make you more than human. But now, you're so much less. Our business concludes here. I'm tired of playing with you. And with that, the king is gone. The explorer is alone, stranded among the snow and the whipping winds of the death zone, but very much alive. He's finally able to go. At long last, after what felt like an eternity, he's escaped. When the explorer arrives in the village again, he's not the explorer at all. It's been years since he went missing on the mountain. The old man who had warned him not to go up onto Mount Everest had passed peacefully in the interim. The other members of his small village would not be afforded the same luxury. Instead, the explorer stumbled back through the village limits, still covering his face. The only sounds he can hear are the wailing wind and his own pitiful sobbing. Everything hurts. He's so terribly afraid. He needs somebody to help him. Why will nobody help him? The sun begins to rise, and the village shakes itself awake. People leave their homes to go about their daily tasks. 
None of them are expecting to see a monster loafing through their streets. A pale, gangling monstrosity, stretched and hairless. It engenders a mix of fear and curiosity as it stumbles around, audibly sobbing with a loud, warped voice. It's like nothing any of them have ever seen before, like something out of a myth or a folktale. But for the monster that was once the explorer, it's so much worse. At first, he thinks that the villagers might be there to help him, but then he sees their eyes, that same intense, burning fire pit orange as the king of the mountain, that same horrible gaze that the explorer thought he'd escaped when he'd left the mountain, the gaze that meant pain, torment, and madness. Even when he tries to cover his face, when he wails at them to go away in words that make sense to no one but him, he can still feel those terrible eyes on him. Is he still on the mountain? Is he still at the mercy of the mountain king? Are these all just illusions or projections, another awful trick? What did he ever do to deserve this kind of torment? Was the crime of wanting to climb a damn mountain worth this kind of everlasting suffering? Did it earn him the gaze of all these monstrous eyes? The explorer begins to feel his anguish being replaced by another feeling, rapidly rising rage, the kind of pure blistering hatred that inexorably leads to one result, violence. First, he screams, then they scream, and finally, the killing begins. The creature that had once been the explorer leaves no stone unturned. Even when they try to run away, he still feels their eyes on him. He needs to kill them all, to annihilate them quickly, leave no trace. It's the only way he can feel anything close to at peace again. It becomes a kind of terrible chain reaction. The sound of the horrors going on in the street only entices more to come outside and see what's going on, to look at the creature causing all this carnage, to see its face. They have no idea that this very action is dooming them. And within the hour, the village is empty, save for one creature, the creature that had once been the explorer, now just afraid, confused, and alone. He will always be alone. The anomaly that will soon be known as SCP-096 simply bows its head and weeps. A climber struggles on the side of the mountain. He's so close to the summit of Mount Everest that he can taste it. He just needs to triumph over this last difficult section, and he will have fulfilled his lifetime dream of standing at the top of the world. He needs to hurry, though. At this altitude, the air is so thin and the temperature is so cold that your body is slowly dying. There's a reason this topmost section of the mountain is known as the Death Zone. He glances down behind him and spots something. Is that another climber? That's strange, he thinks. He was at the very back of his group, and there shouldn't have been anyone else coming up behind him. It must be a solo climber. The soloist doesn't look to be moving, though. He's just staring at him, and the climber can't seem to take his eyes off him. Suddenly, the climber starts feeling odd. He begins to feel warm and comfortable. The aches and pains of the long journey melt away. He decides to sit down on a small ledge and relax. He watches as the solo climber comes towards him. He must be a professional with the way he effortlessly moves up the mountain. He watches him make great time, getting closer and closer. He loses sight as the solo climber reaches the same difficult section he had been struggling with. He imagines the solo climber will soon zip past him on his way to the summit. But just then, the soloist pops up right in front of him. He clasps his hands on the climber's shoulders and pulls him close staring into his eyes with those dark, black goggles. They feel like they're pulling him into their depths, and there's nothing he can do to resist it. The climber tries to scream, but all that comes out of his mouth is silence. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-1529, also known as King of the Mountain. But first, a quick personal request from me. I need your help to spread the word about the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives. The best thing you can do to help me is subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This is a huge help and will let me bring you more and more SCP videos. Now, back to our file. SCP-1529 is an entity with a humanoid appearance that resides near the summit of Mount Everest in Nepal. It is only found above 8,000 meters, which places it in the part of the mountain referred to as the Death Zone, where oxygen levels are too low to support human life for any extended period of time. It is roughly equivalent to an average human male in height and weight, and its outer appearance resembles normal mountaineering clothes, 
with a heavy parka, pants, and boots that are all white in color. Its face is completely obscured by a large hood, with the only visible detail being a pair of large, dark goggles. SCP-1529 has never been seen wearing any other outfit, and in fact, it is unknown whether these are articles of clothing at all, or if they are actually a part of its body. The SCP Foundation first became aware of an anomalous entity lurking near the top of Mount Everest in the 1970s, when climbing expeditions to the summit became more commonplace among professional and amateur mountaineers alike. Rumors began to spread and told of a monster that was killing unfortunate climbers. In 1999, the body of George Mallory, who is believed to be the first person to reach the top of Mount Everest, was located, and photographic film found on his body was developed. From those pictures, it is now known that SCP-1529 was present at least as early as his 1924 expedition. When sufficient daylight and a lack of cloud cover allows observation of the peak by telescope, SCP-1529 can be seen sitting or lying on the mountain, apparently motionless in an inactive state. These motionless periods have been seen to last anywhere from 17 minutes to as long as 8 months. When active though, it can be seen summiting and descending the upper portion of the mountain, though it never uses any climbing tools and will ignore established climbing ropes and ladders that have been installed by other climbers. It has also been observed easily traversing portions of the mountain that are considered too difficult or altogether impossible by experienced climbers. Additionally, SCP-1529 is not impacted by the freezing temperatures, extreme wind speeds, or low oxygen levels at the top of the mountain, and it has never once been seen to stumble, fall, or even lose its grip. It is unknown what prompts SCP-1529 to become active or enter a resting inactive phase nor has there been any established correlation of these phases to weather, time of year, or traffic on the mountain. Its active periods have been observed to last between mere hours to several days, but the exact amount is hard to know for sure. Nighttime observation of 1529 has so far been impossible even with thermal imaging cameras since it produces no heat, with its temperatures being the same as that of the surrounding environment. When in its active phase, if a human climber passes the 8,000 meter mark, then SCP-1529 will begin to make its way towards them, putting itself in the path between the climber and either the summit if they are ascending, or their camp if they are descending. It seems to prefer to go after solo climbers, or those that are significantly ahead or behind their climbing group, but it has been observed targeting climbers in a group when a solo opportunity is not available. Once SCP-1529 is within eyesight of its targeted climber, it will attempt to gain their attention and then lock eyes with them, which produces a hypnotic effect. The climber will find that they are unable to break eye contact with SCP-1529 and will then begin to experience feelings of warmth and euphoria, similar to the effects of hypothermia and hypoxia, also known as altitude sickness. The victim will feel the overwhelming desire to sit down where they are, and once they stop moving, SCP-1529 will quickly close the distance between them. Once SCP-1529 reaches the victim, death is almost a certainty. An examination of bodies has shown the cause to be from hypothermia. Strangely, it's been observed that victims seem to succumb within just one to two hours after having first made eye contact with SCP-1529, a period of time much shorter than usual for climbers trapped on the summit of Everest. After death, the victim's bodies experience an accelerated rate of decay and after mere hours or days, the bodies become rotted and mummified at a level comparable to bodies that have been exposed to the wind and cold of the mountain for decades. Many of the over 200 deaths on Mount Everest have been attributed to SCP-1529, and the rare survivor of an encounter is almost always due to the intervention of another mountaineer, who was able to offer assistance to the entranced climber before SCP-1529 was able to reach them. There have been several notable reports from survivors of interactions with SCP-1529. One, known as Incident 1529-1, is also the only documented instance of SCP-1529 descending below the 8,000 meter mark. During the incident, the entity entered Camp 5, located on the northern approach of the mountain at 7,775 meters, which resulted in multiple deaths, including two Foundation personnel who were operating the monitoring posts. One climber, who had initially believed to have been killed in the incident, was discovered to still be alive two days later when Foundation personnel were conducting investigations at the camp. He was safely removed from the mountain, though he required the amputation of several frostbitten fingers and toes. During an interview with a Foundation agent, they described spotting SCP-1529 just 10 minutes after leaving the summit of the mountain. After locking eyes with the entity, 
they began to feel happy, comfortable, and relieved, like they were back at home next to a warm fire. But then suddenly the warmth was gone, and they experienced a sensation of cold more powerful than anything they had felt before. They were stuck, and could only watch as 1529 made its way towards them. When it finally reached them, it placed its hands on their shoulders and pulled them up into its face so that they were staring right into its black goggles. Images began to appear in the dark depths of the goggles. People warm and happy, sitting next to fires, in hot baths, or sunning on a beach. They tried to resist the strange pull of the creature with all of their might. They then heard something in their mind, a question from SCP-1529. It asked, you would refuse my gift. The stranded climbers struggled to answer, using all of their willpower and strength to move their lips and whisper a single word. Yes. SCP-1529 responded by showing more images of people, but this time, they were bodies lying dead in the snow. Countless victims trapped on Mount Everest forever. SCP-1529 made them watch their deaths play out in long, drawn-out detail, a witness to every second of their demise. The climber was sure they would soon join them, but then they found something deep inside of them, a spark of life, a will to resist. They clenched their fist, and with their final ounce of strength, they punched SCP-1529. The goggles appeared to crack, and the next thing the climber knew, they were woken up by the Foundation Recovery Team. Following this encounter, the climber never attempted to summit another mountain. When they eventually passed away some years later, an autopsy revealed that their cause of death was consistent with extreme hypothermia, frostbite, and cerebral edema, despite not having been in a cold environment or above 500 meters in altitude in the previous 12 months. SCP-1529 has been classified as Euclid and is to be kept under telescope and satellite surveillance whenever possible, though telescope observation should make use of a delayed video feed, as observers have reported seeing SCP-1529 appearing to stare back at them and reported feeling symptoms consistent with an encounter, including hypothermia and frostbite. The Foundation maintains communication with civilian mountaineering expeditions to prevent summiting attempts when SCP-1529 is active. The bodies of any victims are to be removed from the mountain, if possible, for autopsy, with their deaths being officially classified as having been from natural causes related to altitude sickness and hypothermia. Any survivors of encounters with SCP-1529 are to be debriefed and administered amnestics. Mobile Task Force Psi-29029, also known as Alpine Echo, is to remain on standby at all times at a permanent monitoring station, with on-duty members remaining in a pressurized environment acclimatized to 7,900 meters above sea level, allowing them to quickly deploy via helicopter if need be. Finally, and most troubling, is that aerial surveillance of another mountain has revealed an individual similar in appearance to SCP-1529. The location remains classified, and the local government has prohibited climbing on the peak, so threats to humanity are minimal at this time. But the Foundation will continue to monitor it and other mountains for anomalous activity. Your phone suddenly vibrates. A text alert. Nothing too surprising about that. But you don't recognize the number. You open the message, and there's no text, just a picture. A strange figure dressed all in black, with a face that looks like the skull of a dog. Who sent this, you think to yourself? Is this a prank? You try to put it out of your mind and go about your day. The next day, there's another message from the same number. You open this one to find the same dog skull-faced creature staring back at you. But this time, you recognize the background. Is that your house he's standing in front of? Now you're getting a little freaked out. Someone is trying to mess with you, you're sure of it. But what can you do? Another couple days pass, and you get another message. You don't need to look to know it's that same number again. You've been getting plenty of these over the last few days. You're really scared now, and you run out of the house to your car. You've got to get out of here. You drive, and while stopped at a light, you decide to finally check this latest message and see what it is. It's the creature again, but this time, it's a picture of him sitting in the back seat of your car. You put your phone down and slowly turn your head. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-1471, also known as Mallow version 1.0.0. SCP-1471 is a very interesting anomaly, 
that's not really a creature or a monster or even an object. It's a mobile app. It's 9.8 megabytes in size and is freely available in online application stores where it's listed under the name Mallow version 1.0.0. There's no developer listed on any of the stores and it seems as though the app is somehow able to bypass the normal application approval process and appear directly on the stores for wide distribution. Once SCP-1471 is downloaded and installed on a device, there are no icons, shortcuts, or widgets like you'd expect when installing software. It also does not appear on program managers, and once installed, it seems there's no way to remove it. Within three to six hours of installing the app, the individual whose device it is will begin receiving mysterious picture messages. All of these images will have one thing in common. Somewhere in the foreground or background is a large humanoid figure with a canine-like skull for a head and long black hair. This creature has been designated SCP-1471-A. Sometime during the first 24 hours following the installation of SCP-1471, the individual's device will start to receive slightly different images from before. These images still always contain instances of 1471-A, but now the locations will be recognizable to the individual. These pictures will be of places that the individual regularly frequents, like their local grocery store, their school, or their work. These sorts of images will continue to be received until 48 hours since the initial installation has passed. At that point, the device will start to receive images of places that the individual recently visited, like an image of the restaurant where they picked up their lunch an hour ago. Just as before, all of these images have SCP-1471-A somewhere in them, as if it's been following them and wants them to know it. After 72 hours, things get even stranger. Now the pictures received by the individual will be of them in real time. They might receive a picture of themselves sitting on the couch, taking in that exact moment, except SCP-1471-A is standing right behind them. But when they look, there's nothing there. It's as if someone is photoshopping in this bizarre canid creature, but doing so impossibly fast. Finally, after over 90 hours have passed since the app was installed, the weirdness reaches its peak. The individual no longer receives photo messages, but instead will start to catch glimpses of SCP-1471-A in real life, either in their peripheral vision, in reflective surfaces, or in both. At this point, the individual afflicted will continue having visualizations of SCP-1471-A in the real world, a result that so far has been irreversible. Individuals who have reached this extreme stage of exposure have reported that the entity appears to be trying to visually communicate with them, but none of them have been able to understand or comprehend whatever message it's trying to relay. Such was the case with a subject named William. William had first been exposed to SCP-1471 at 15 years old when his sister, Sarah, showed him an app she had downloaded earlier in the day. The app's description states that you will never have to settle for awkward feelings of being alone ever again. That Mallow is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued, and that after just a few hours of Mallow, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Neither William nor his sister knew how the app worked, but they assumed it was tracking them using some kind of GPS, and soon, William was receiving images from SCP-1471. The first one he received was of his school's courtyard, with SCP-1471-A, barely noticeable, sitting on a bench. He had black, matted fur, knife-like claws, a set of blank, pure white eyes, and a face that looked like the skull of a beast with a large, wolfish grin. William was immediately frightened by this, but Sarah insisted it was cute and funny. William wasn't so sure. The pictures continued over the following days, with SCP-1471-A appearing at his school, at his bus stop, on his street, nearly everywhere he went. And then, the pictures started appearing as if they had just been taken the moment they were received. William and Sarah were both being sent the same type of nightmare-inducing images, and they tried to delete the app from their phone to stop them, but they couldn't find where the application was stored. Then, things got even worse. 
The creature started appearing to William and Sarah in the real world. William, as it turns out, was the lucky one, as SCP-1471-A primarily appeared to him in reflective surfaces like mirrors, which he could cover with a curtain when he didn't want to see the strange dog skull face with its toothy grin staring back at him. Sarah was less fortunate. She saw the creature everywhere she looked, it always appearing just outside of her periphery, catching glimpses out of the corner of her eye, or feeling it looming over her and watching her as she slept. William has been able to cope with the appearances of 1471A, even regarding it as a somewhat comforting presence at times. Sarah, sadly, was driven mad by the never-ending visions of the creature. Currently, the only known treatment to reverse the effects of SCP-1471 and the appearances of 1471A is to eliminate the individual's exposure to the images before 90 hours have passed after installing the app. Once those 90 hours have elapsed, though, it is too late, and SCP-1471-A becomes a permanent presence in the individual's life. Thankfully, 1471-A has thus far remained non-hostile and has not been shown to pose a threat to those afflicted by it, at least not a physical threat. All mobile devices that are found to have Mallow version 1.0.0 installed on them are to be confiscated and analyzed for any potential information as to who might have created the application, as well as leads for other devices that may have been infected. Following this investigation, the device's batteries are to be removed and the device placed in Storage Unit 91 at Research Site 45. Additionally, all online application stores for mobile devices are to be monitored to prevent unsuspecting users from inadvertently downloading the anomalous software. Any individuals who are suspected of having downloaded SCP-1471 will have their device targeted by a self-uploading malware that can disable it until it's able to be seized by Foundation agents. Due to the unpredictable nature of the anomaly and the potential sentience of the software itself, SCP-1471 has been classified as Euclid by the SCP Foundation and research into ways to hopefully one day contain the anomalous software is ongoing. A thumb pulls back the hammer on a loaded pistol. Even under all his thick, warm layers of coats and sweaters to protect him from the cold, the musher can still feel his heart pounding in his chest. All the long months of training with his team has all been leading to this moment. He grips the reins as tightly as he can, all eight of his dogs attached to the other side of the sled beneath his feet. It's about to start any second now bang the shot of the starter pistol rings out and the second it does all 16 pairs of paws are dashing through the icy alaskan snow the musher catches specks of white as they spray out from the sled in front and encourages his pack to pull harder run faster the race is on and he intends to win then all of a sudden he hears an agitating grating voice calling out to him trying to divert his attention away from the race out of the corner of his peripheral he notices the movement of another pack of dogs pulling another sled up alongside his. They wouldn't try to ram him and knock his sled off course, but the musher still expects them to try and overtake, so he shoots a glance to his fellow competitor. And under his scarf, his jaw drops at who he sees driving the other sled. It can't be. It makes absolutely no sense that someone with that degree of wealth would be taking part in a dog sled race through the snow. But even under his ski goggles, the musher is certain of who he's looking at. It's him, grinning and waving at the musher from a neighboring sled. One thought shoots across his mind. Is that Elon Musk? The eccentric billionaire signals the musher to lower the fur-lined hood of his winter coat. Still unable to fully believe his own eyes, let alone come up with a logical explanation for what he's seeing, the musher finds himself lifting the hood back so he can hear what the man has to say. His smile is unnatural, overly forced, like he's trying too hard to replicate what a normal human expression looks like. The moment the musher's hood is down, he hears that bizarrely familiar tone of voice again as the man starts selling. He's trying to sell him one of those outlandish brain chips of his. The musher remembers reading an article about them and the billionaire's strange and unbelievable claims as to what these dangerous implants can do. Are people already so wise to his products being scams that he's resorting to propositioning random sled racers? The race. The musher is so distracted by the hard-pitching billionaire that he almost forgets to focus on the path in front of him. And at any rate, even if he did want a microchip installed in his head, he definitely can't afford the price tag. He tells the man to get lost, then focuses on his dogs. 
only to hear the deafening sound of a jet engine erupting next to him, followed by a huge wall of snow. It's an avalanche. Hours later, the musher wakes up in the hospital, having been dragged out of the snow. The doctor asks him what happened, and when he tells the doctor that he was distracted by Elon Musk trying to sell him cutting-edge technology, the doctor orders an immediate brain scan. However, the results of the brain scan come back clean. No brain damage, no illicit chemicals, but no matter what, the musher sticks to his story. Elon Musk distracted him on the slopes that day. Elon Musk and his gaggle of cyborg dogs. A nondescript man in a black suit turns up later that day, claiming to be a psychological specialist. The doctors leave the man in the black suit alone with the musher. The strange man notes down every detail of the story. He doesn't judge, he doesn't dispute, he just listens to every bizarre detail. Elon Musk, cyborg dogs, avalanche and all. When the story is done, the man in black pulls a photograph from his jacket and asks if this was the man the musher saw out there on the slopes. But no. The photo shows a bizarre creature, vaguely human-shaped but with multiple pairs of arms and horns sprouting from the top of its head. The only thing it has in common with the man he saw on the slopes is the creature's face. It's the face of Elon Musk. This whole ordeal makes the musher feel incredibly distressed, but the man in the black suit remains calm. He tells the musher that he can make it all better. He gives the musher a special medication that makes the memory of his time on the slope fade away. It feels as strange and distant as a half-remembered dream. But that doesn't mean it wasn't real. The warning of buyer beware is always applicable, but especially when you're buying from a businessman with a history of dubious claims, or at least someone who looks an awful lot like said businessman. Meet SCP-3710, or as those working among the staff at the SCP Foundation have taken to calling it, Elon Mush. Now, SCP-3710 isn't a single entity, but rather a collection of strange anomalies that manifest together to form the SCP in question. On their own, each entity is just a component, but you put them all together and you have… well, one of the strangest anomalies in the Foundation's catalog. Primarily, SCP-3710 consists of a pack of eight dogs, except of course, these aren't the average pooches you'd find at the local pound, they're highly anomalous. Each one of these peculiar pups has been extensively cybernetically enhanced, and even bears a close resemblance to the dogs that form SCP-2624, an anomalous cybernetic space dog. How enhanced are we talking exactly? Well, if you're looking for technical specifications, how does a miniaturized Raptor rocket propulsion device sound? Each of these cyber canines is equipped with one of these methane-powered rocket boosters, and Foundation researchers believe that the propulsion system of each one is fueled by the dog's digestive system. All eight of these cybernetic dogs are reined to a sled in what seems to be a weird mix of high-tech and low-tech transportation. But SCP-3710 is clearly another of the many anomalies that aren't concerned with making sense. The sled itself appears to be totally ordinary from the outside, apart from the addition of the two twin Raptor rocket propulsion devices welded to the back. Okay, so it's a dog sled that's been modified by someone who either really likes to go fast or is a complete lunatic. Or maybe both. A large white X is also painted on the wooden bed of the dog sled, but that is far from the strangest physical property of the wood itself. The material used to construct this part of SCP-3710 is stronger than any wood known to man. Presumably achieved through some anomalous means, the normally highly flammable material possesses a physically impossible resistance to fire. Neither the excessive heat from the eight dogs' rockets or the pair mounted on the sled itself are enough to cause the wooden sled to combust simply doesn't burn, making it surprisingly an even safer vehicle than your average Tesla. Then there's the driver of this anomalous dog sled. SCP-3710-1 is a humanoid entity that claims to be the world's most Twitter-addicted businessman, Elon Musk. However, the creature itself has an entirely different physical appearance from the billionaire himself, apart from its extremely recognizable face. The most striking baseline physical dissimilarities are, of course, the fact that the creature possesses four arms and horns that protrude noticeably from its skull. Despite being fluent in quotes from Elon Musk, SCP-3710-1 shares none of the same behavioral traits, which is undoubtedly a redeeming factor for this anomaly. The SCP Foundation researchers who study SCP-3710-1 have discovered, through all recorded interactions with the entity, that its mannerisms more closely resemble that of a door-to-door -door salesperson than an abrasive CEO. 
However, despite all these obvious differences, anyone unlucky enough to interact with an instance of SCP-3710-1 will believe the entity is, in fact, Elon Musk, thanks to a latent mimetic effect. And while that's undoubtedly unpleasant for all involved, it gets slightly worse. You might notice that we did use the phrase, an instance of SCP-3710-1, because, that's right, there's more than one. Specifically, and mercifully, only two that the Foundation is currently aware of, both manifesting with their own rocket-powered cyberdog-driven sleds. Now, once you recover from the horror at the possibility of a world with more than one version of a sled-driving electric car CEO, you might find yourself confused as to the connection between the aforementioned business magnate and the sport of dog sledding. The same confusion baffles the Foundation too, but here's what they do know so far. SCP-3710, that's the Robodogs, the sled, and their painfully irritating passenger, are known to manifest at random intervals along the route of the Iditarod Trail sled dog race. This is an annual long-distance dog sled racing event that occurs in early March in Alaska. The route usually runs from the state's largest city of Anchorage to the southern Seward Peninsula city of Nome. Upon appearing, SCP-3710 will then chase after a targeted racer taking part in the Iditarod, following them until it is alongside them or at least within vocal range. Now, you might be worried that this anomaly tries to take part in the sled race or somehow harm the other contenders. While its goal is disrupting the Iditarod, it's not known to cause active harm. Once it catches the attention of another sled racer, then SCP-3710 attempts to persuade the competitor to purchase one of the latest products currently being produced by one of the billionaire's various companies. Of course, if you are participating in an annual dog sled race and suddenly you see what appears to be one of the most famous CEOs in the world pull up beside you in a sled pulled by cybernetically enhanced dogs, you might be compelled to do one of two things. The first being speed up to try and escape him. The other might be to hear him out, to satiate your curiosity if nothing else. But the average participant in the Iditarod typically can't afford one of the more cutting-edge products offered by the billionaire's various companies. So naturally, they typically refuse, because they either don't need or can't pay for something so expensive. This doesn't deter SCP-3710, however. Apparently, the one trait it shares with the person it impersonates is a lack of understanding for the financial status of average everyday people, so it keeps offering until the other sled racer has refused at least three times, sometimes requiring more, to really drive the message home. With that, SCP-3710 typically takes off, stating it isn't interested in negotiating any further, and engages the propulsion devices of its eight robodogs and the two on the back of the sled. Of course, these highly dangerous Raptor boosters can cause severe burns, blunt force wind damage, and other environmental hazards to the other racers. The first recorded appearance of SCP-3710 takes place in the year 1995. During the course of the year's Iditarod, the entity makes several attempts to sell ZIP-2 software licenses to the various racers competing in the sledding event. Given that it offers these licenses at the staggering fee of $50,000 each, not one of the participants is interested. Shortly after the conclusion of the Iditarod 95, the SCP Foundation starts looking into the anomaly. They begin by contacting the real deal, Elon Musk himself. When asked about his whereabouts, he tells the Foundation that he was in New York City, over 3,000 miles away from where the Iditarod takes place every year. The Foundation, having confirmed that the entity manifesting during the sled race was, indeed, an imposter, try next to capture the anomaly. This doesn't go well at all they send out six Foundation operatives, all of them disguised as dog sled racers. SCP-3710 manifests yet again, but manages to evade the six-person team sent to capture it. It flies away by firing up its boosters and thoughtlessly buries the six Foundation agents under an avalanche. However, as we all most likely know by now, the SCP Foundation isn't one for giving up after just one try. They proceed to make numerous attempts to capture and question SCP-3710, including going as far as to administer amnestics to any of the Iditarod competitors who claim to have seen the entity. That way, with their memories wiped, word of the strange sledding salesman can never get out to the public. Whenever it appears during the annual Alaskan sled race, Foundation agents on the site attempt to use specialized tranquilizer rifles to apprehend SCP-3710. These, however, usually don't work, given the anomaly's fondness for just flying away with its Robodog's boosters or vanishing entirely when it demanifests. But you're probably wondering what happens should someone decide to accept one of SCP-3710's extortionate offers during the race? Can somebody actually purchase an overpriced electric car or a potentially deadly brain chip from the anomaly? 
the Foundation ponders the very same question, and during one of their many containment attempts, is able to get an answer. Agent Cheyenne McCormick is sent undercover to participate in the annual Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race. Her instructions from the Foundation higher-ups are clear. Should she encounter SCP-3710, she's to reject its first two attempts at selling her anything. But then, the third time it offers, McCormick is told to accept. Armed with a debit card containing $100,000, she sets out on her sled. One key detail is left out. Nobody tells Agent McCormick what SCP-3710-1 looks like. While she's out on the Iditarod, her dogs racing along and pulling her sled behind them through the snow, the agent soon becomes aware of another pack of dogs running up alongside hers. A short few seconds later, and she soon hears a voice hailing her from the other sled. SCP-3710-1 greets her as a valued customer and gives a disjointed opening speech as an introduction to its sales pitch. It begins by talking about doing something important even when the odds are not in your favor. SCP-3710-1 claims brands are just perception and that perceptions can change over time. Then it doubles down its previous statement by stating that brands are just the collective impression of a product. That's when it offers her a brand new Tesla electric car. Confused, the agent questions if SCP-3710-1 is meant to be who she thinks it's meant to be. The entity claims it is, indeed, the one and only highly recognizable businessman. It also states that it would be in violation of SpaceX policy if it wasn't who it claims to be, before then offering the Foundation agent a Tesla for over $200,000. When she rejects the offer and tells the entity she can't afford that, it then lowers the price to $150,000. SCP-3710-1 also claims that when Henry Ford first made cheap, reliable cars available to the public, there were those who rejected this in favor of horses. The agent follows her prior instructions and tells the entity for a second time that the asking price is too expensive. Using presumably much the same justification the real Elon Musk employs, SCP-3710-1 explains that offering a compelling product means charging a premium. However, it then offers Agent McCormick the third, lower price of $50,000. It even makes the lofty promise that she could be driving her new Tesla as early as the following day. Just as she has been told to, the agent accepts the much lower price. As thanks for doing business, the product hawking anomaly includes an additional bonus to her purchase. It says it will give the agent a once-in-a-lifetime add-on, and not one typically seen with other electric car purchases. SCP-3710-1 claims it will give cybernetic rocket propulsion enhancements to both Agent McCormick and her team of sled dogs. It tells her that the first step is to establish something as physically impossible. Then cybernetic surgery can occur. Before the agent can even question what is going on, something happens that causes her to suddenly vanish without a trace. The Foundation is confounded following the loss of contact with Agent McCormick. A team of retrieval operatives is deployed to her latest known location within the area of Alaska where the Iditarod takes place. They follow her last recorded GPS tracker to find no evidence of where she went or what happened to her. Even the dogs that had been pulling her sled are nowhere to be found. Any hope that she'd be found alive and well dissipates the moment that the retrieval team comes across Agent McCormick's abandoned sled, left unattended in the middle of the trail. Beyond the audio recordings of the interaction between the agent and SCP-3710-1, there is only one other piece of evidence to prove that it even took place at all. Foundation agents notice a bank transfer, bearing the exact date of Agent McCormick's untimely disappearance. The amount transferred is $50,000, sent from an SCP Foundation front company to the sales account of Tesla Incorporated. For three whole weeks following the incident, there's no change no sign of the missing agent, and no reappearance of SCP-3710. That is, until a blip is noticed on one of the SCP Foundation's monitors, a tiny blinking spot on a map, highlighting a location so far away that nobody would ever think to even search there. Agent McCormick's GPS locator has reactivated, but she's not in Alaska anymore. Instead, the signal relayed to the Foundation puts her over five and a half thousand miles away, in Tahiti, the Foundation hurries to triangulate her exact position, and a retrieval team is sent out to her coordinates. It looks like she's somewhere off the western coast of the French Polynesian island, in the shallower waters of the Pacific Ocean. The team rushes to the location, hoping that if they make it quick enough, their fellow Foundation operative will still be alive, although we're not certain any of them could predict what they'd actually find. Following the GPS locator, the team discovers a Tesla Model 3, 
a car that isn't due to be released until several months from the time they found it. Immediately, the retrieval experts began to examine the vehicle, searching for any further signs of the missing Foundation agent. And sure enough, they quickly find her. Agent McCormick is alive in the trunk of the electric vehicle, although not exactly in the same state she was in when she disappeared. Much to the horror of those that have discovered her, the agent has undergone severe and invasive cybernetic surgical modification. Anyone with an affinity for that type of enhancement might hope for a mechanical arm that shoots rockets or has hidden blades or maybe a spinal device that can make a person run faster than the human eye can perceive. But Foundation Agent Cheyenne McCormick isn't so lucky. Her entire lower jaw, including her esophagus, has been replaced with a Raptor propulsion device. Whoever is responsible for the mechanical modification of the missing agent had left a handwritten note attached to Agent McCormick's forehead, which read, Thank you for purchasing from Tesla Incorporated. We deeply regret the conditions under which we are forced to return your representative. An accident occurred when they attempted to prevent the agreed-upon dog modification, as stated in Article 1, Subsection 3 of our verbal purchase agreement. Upon purchase, the customer shall cede all dogs in his or her possession for propulsion modification in preparation for SpaceX's excursion to Enceladus. The note then concludes with a link to fill out a customer satisfaction survey. Foundation experts would later discover that this URL posed a cognitohazardous threat. Additionally, the note contained thanks for the agent's contribution of money and dogs towards the Tesla SpaceX Rocket Dog Initiative. After stating he hopes they'll shop with Tesla again, the note is signed with the all-too-familiar name of the company's infamous CEO. The following year, the Iditarod starts up once again, and just like many times before, SCP-3710 makes its usual repeat appearance. But this time, there's a slight difference. Now, a second identical instance of SCP-3710-1 manifests alongside the original, with its own matching rocket-powered sled complete with cybernetically modified dogs. The dog team pulling this new instance's sled matches the description of the dogs that had pulled Agent McCormick's sled a year earlier. But of course, they too have seemingly undergone the same cybernetic surgery to implant them with Raptor propulsion devices. The SCP Foundation's researchers theorize that SCP-3710 manifests during the Iditarod race primarily for two reasons. For one, it's an isolated route through the snowy tundra of Alaska, with not a lot of witnesses, save for the participating sled racers and their dogs, but therein lies the second reason, the dogs. Given the intense physical training these sled dogs undergo, it seems that makes them ideal candidates for SCP-3710's cruel, sadistic, and unapproved cybernetic experiments. As the old adage says, buyer beware, and as a general rule of thumb, we'd recommend not buying anything from someone who claims to be a genius. A pair of SCP Foundation researchers open the door of a containment cell and find themselves staring at something unlike anything they've ever seen before. Sitting in the middle of the room is a giant lump that appears to be made of what can only be described as flesh. The two look at each other in disbelief. Just what is this thing? They circle the huge blob, looking it over, wondering what on earth it could be. One of the researchers finally gets the courage to actually feel it. He finds that it's warm to the touch, and does he detect some slight movement? He slowly moves to place his ear against it to listen, but a sudden shudder from the mask sends him jumping back in fright. Just then, the other researcher calls to him from the other side of the sphere. It sounds like he has found something. As he approaches, he too sees what caused his partner to call out. There, in the middle of this tumorous ball, is a door. It's a circular iron hatch the kind sealed by a valve, and it's open. Now the researchers are really confused. A massive lump of living flesh is strange enough, but why does it have a door? One of the researchers peeks inside. Is that a couch they see? And a table? Does someone live in this thing? Things are getting beyond strange. The two researchers look up at the observation window where their supervisor is watching them. The supervisor does not hesitate. He nods at them, and the researchers know what they must do. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. The researcher who lost winces. He knew that coming to work at the SCP Foundation meant that he would be dealing with some strange, dangerous, and disgusting anomalies, but he never imagined he would have to climb inside a giant orb of meat. His partner opens the hatch all the way and offers a hand to help him. 
Knowing he has no other option, the researcher steps inside. Inside, the air is hot, thick, and moist, like a cramped gym that's had too many bodies exerting themselves on a warm, humid day. He walks through the short entranceway, and his eyes adjust to the dim light to find that he's standing in the middle of a cozy little room. A single, small lamp on a table is giving off just enough light for him to see that the room is sparsely furnished, with a few pieces including a small couch and a twin bed. Outside, his partner calls to him, asking what he can see. As the researcher turns to answer, the door snaps shut. The valve spins on its own, locking itself tight. Try as he might, the researcher can't get it to budge. He bangs on the door and yells, Is he all right in there? Is everything okay? His only response is a muffled scream from inside the ball of flesh. He keeps pulling at the door, twisting the valve with all of his strength, but it won't move. The sounds of gurgles and wet sloshing come from inside the meaty growth. An alarm starts to sound as he strains against the door, exerting himself so hard that he feels like a vein in his head might burst. Suddenly, the valve loosens, and the sudden lack of resistance causes him to fall to the floor. The valve spins on its own, and the door swings open once again. The ball of flesh is quiet once more. The researcher picks himself up off the ground and slowly, carefully, peeks inside. Hello? Are you okay? Is anyone in there? There's no response. That is, until a blast of hot air comes rushing out of the hatch, blowing the researcher's hair back. When it's over, he peeks inside again. His fellow researcher is nowhere to be seen. Inside is the same couch, bed, and table with a small lamp. But there's something new there, too. Across from the couch, where there was nothing before, is a small television. While this may seem strange, it's just another day at the SCP Foundation, where anomalous objects and creatures are studied and contained, including SCP-002, also known as The Living Room. SCP-002 is the designation given to a large, tumorous, fleshy growth. It's roughly spherical, with a circumference just over 15 meters, giving it an estimated volume of around 60 meters cubed. Located on one side is an iron valve hatch, similar to what might be found on an old submarine, which leads into the interior of the ball. Those who step inside are surprised to discover a small room that resembles a low-rent studio apartment, complete with furniture and even a small window. Strangely, the outside of the ball of flesh shows no windows, and indeed no openings at all, save for the iron hatch. The furniture in the room displays no anomalous properties, though examination has revealed that the furniture appears to be constructed of sculpted bone, woven hair, and other biological substances, all coming from human bodies. Analysis of samples taken from the furniture has shown each to be constructed from independent and fragmented DNA sequences, several of which correspond to SCP research personnel who have been lost inside of SCP-002. To date, the living room has been responsible for seven members of staff going missing. At the same time, during the course of its containment at the SCP Foundation, the room appears to have added multiple additional furnishings, including two lamps, a throw rug, a television, a radio, a beanbag chair, three books in an unknown language, four children's toys, and a small potted plant. Tests have been performed using a variety of non-human entities in order to see if they would provoke a similar response from SCP-002 to that of humans. Various lab animals, including those with close DNA to humans such as chimpanzees, have been placed in the room. But so far, all have failed to make the living room react. Human cadavers were also tested, but they too did not produce any effect. It is unknown what causes SCP-002 to engage in its behavior, but whatever process it uses to convert organic matter into furnishings seems to only be triggered by the presence of living human beings. SCP-002 was discovered in northern Portugal, following reports of an object falling from Earth's orbit. There, in the bottom of a small crater, was SCP-002. It was encased in a thick shell of rock, but the anomaly's fleshy exterior could be seen through cracks that were likely created by the impact. A local farmer was the first to spot the object falling to Earth and brought word of what he found to his village. At the same time, a Level 4 SCP Foundation agent stationed in the area detected elevated levels of radioactivity and traced the source back to the crater. 
An SCP collection squad led by General Mulhausen was dispatched to the impact site and quickly secured the area. Test subjects from the nearby village were recruited for initial analysis of the object, with three men being individually sent inside of SCP-002, all of whom disappeared. Having confirmed this anomaly's deadly properties, General Mulhausen then issued a Level 4A termination order that would apply to any local witnesses in order to ensure that no knowledge of the object reached the outside world. He then oversaw its transport to an SCP containment facility. As Foundation staff prepped SCP-002 for relocation, four members of the security personnel were seemingly mesmerized and drawn inside the object where they too disappeared. This was the first hint that SCP-002 possesses some form of subtle mind control, with the ability to influence humans into stepping inside of it. It was after these losses that it was first noticed that the object appeared to grow new furnishings following someone disappearing inside. After these mishaps, General Mulhausen ordered all staff to wear hazmat suits when dealing with SCP-002, and following the General's own termination, SCP-002 was placed in containment at the secure facility where it currently resides. Due to the ongoing danger presented by SCP-002, the risk it poses to any who step inside of it, and the mind control abilities it possesses, it has been classified as Euclid. It is to remain connected at all times to a suitable power supply to keep it in a charging mode of some kind, which appears to make it more docile. In the event of a power outage, staff in the immediate area are to be evacuated and the object's containment cell emergency barrier is to be closed, sealing it off from the rest of the site. Once power is re-established, strobing X-ray and ultraviolet lights are to be activated in the containment cell until SCP-002 is returned to its charging mode. Research teams investigating SCP-002 that will come within 20 meters of the object must consist of no fewer than two members. Personnel should also maintain physical contact with one another at all times to confirm that the other is present and not experiencing any feelings of confusion, dull perception, or other forms of bewilderment that may lead to them entering the living room. No personnel at all below a level 3 clearance are allowed inside of SCP-002, and any staff that have contact with the anomaly are to be escorted no less than 5 kilometers away and must undergo a 72-hour quarantine and psychological evaluation. SCP-002 is one of the oldest anomalies in the SCP Foundation database, but remains one of the least understood. Perhaps one day we'll understand what it is, and why it was at one time sitting in the orbit of Earth. Did someone send it here, intending us to one day find it? Did it come here of its own volition? Or did we put it there ourselves, in an attempt to keep it away? Ashen-faced villagers walk in a solemn line down a long dirt road. The light from their torches makes their faces into masks of shadows. They chant in an ancient and arcane language as they move in a procession towards the darkened cemetery on the edge of the village. It's an unpleasant duty, but a burden that they must carry nonetheless. In the middle of the procession is the one being honored tonight, one of the village elders. And in this village, to be an elder is a truly special thing. From his wizened, creaking body, his deep-set eyes milky with cataracts, his almost transparent, liver-spotted skin, it would appear that he is in his 90s. But in fact, he is over 300 years old. The other villagers pass ghost-like through the gates of the cemetery, crowding around the elder as he hobbles across the uneven terrain. It will be his final pilgrimage, and all of them, including him, know it. He breathes a ragged sigh and mutters a prayer to the deity that he will soon be meeting. Up above, the moon shines brilliantly. Down below, a chasm yawns in an open grave with something very old and very powerful roiling underneath. The villagers do not fear it. They revere it. They worship it. It gave them everything they have. The elder stands at the mouth of the chasm, staring down into its depths with resolute silence. The village priest opens an ancient book and chants a rite in an antique tongue. His words translate roughly to, to our Lord, our Father, our protector, we commit one of our own back into your hands and heart. For one thing is immutably true. The black gift is only borrowed. The black gift gives us our life. And in death, we return to the black god. 
As he goes on, something rises from the pit, tendrils molded from liquid dark. They reach out and embrace the elder, tenderly wrapping around him and lifting him from the ground. He doesn't scream, though. He simply accepts his fate as the villagers pray, and the tendrils pull him down into the dark. When their prayer is done, there is only silence. The torches go out. The villagers return home. It's just another night for them. There is a village in the deepest, darkest reaches of Eastern Europe, a place forgotten by time, where the locals live by old rules and even older gods. A place where strange rituals occur and people with unnatural abilities thrive. And beneath it all, the blood of a hungry, curious god runs in endless, dark rivers. It goes without saying, something incredibly strange is afoot in Chemnosht, Poland, and the SCP Foundation have designated the heart of the strangeness as SCP-6198. However, the decidedly peculiar locals have a very different name for the phenomenon, Chernobog, Old Slavic for the Black God, an ancient deity said to rule dark fates in the underworld. And considering the events that unfolded in the incredibly old, incredibly isolated village of Chemnosht, this is a reputation that Chernobog has very much earned. Sadly, several members of Foundation personnel had to learn this the hard way. The Foundation first discovered the village when they intercepted strange communications from the local authorities investigating a missing persons case from the Lower Silesian Forest region. While searching for this missing person, Polish police found a series of strange, dark chasms in the ground, each one leading down to a deep, mysterious pit filled with black liquid. This was enough for the Foundation to realize something anomalous was likely occurring here, prompting them to step in and intervene. Before the authorities could arrange any potentially dangerous excursions into one of these chasms, the SCP Foundation showed up under the guise of Poland's Ministry of Public Security and relieved them of their duties. They designated the strange black liquid in the chasms SCP-6198-B and the chasms themselves as SCP-6198-C. Thankfully, while the locals weren't exactly rolling out the welcome wagon, they didn't show active hostility either. Most simply appeared wary and kept their distance, watching Foundation activities from inside their homes and staying out of the way of researchers and guards. Early on, one of the biggest issues was the communication barrier, as the majority of the village spoke an otherwise dead Proto-Slavic dialect that seemed impenetrable even to modern Polish speakers. Linguistic experts became key to facilitating later communications between Foundation personnel and residents of the village. The residents of the village were all quite old, but appeared unusually youthful for their ages. They were all worshippers of Chernobog, and the villagers claimed that, through worshipping Chernobog, they were given the black gift, facilitated by imbibing the dark liquid from the chasms, which they credited with their health, youth, and longevity. The Foundation was obviously interested in figuring out just what exactly this black liquid was, so they began their studying in earnest, but they soon realized something very strange. The chasms were not always there. It seemed that they would only appear for 14-day periods between the new and full moon. The initial exploration into the heart of the village was performed by two intrepid field agents, Agent Kazmierz Nowak and Agent Maria Bakula. Nowak and Bakula arrived in the dilapidated town, finally realizing just how cut off from modern society the place was. Dirt roads, ramshackle wooden buildings surrounded by old ruins, and strange makeshift hierograms everywhere. The duo pulled into town, seeing the many ashen faces of the locals staring at them from nearby windows. They proceeded to the cemetery, where the majority of the chasms were believed to have opened. There, in what appeared to be an open grave, they found themselves staring down into one of the many abysses. Dark, light-absorbing liquid roiled deep below. However, they soon realized that it was time to go when they noticed locals hiding behind the gravestones around them, watching intently. Something was very wrong here. They traveled back into the center of the village, still keenly aware that they were being observed from the sidelines. They approached one of the many houses and attempted to knock. An extremely old woman peered out of the window and began speaking to them in Proto-Slavic, which neither of them could understand. However, as they were leaving, one of them was able to swipe a leather-bound book from a table outside the home, believed to be some kind of Bible for the local religion. While still in town, and still being watched, the duo collected a sample of the black gift from a local well, then began making their way back to their vehicle. 
The whole time, they were followed by an eerie old man who looked to be in his 90s, but was surprisingly spry for his age. The two left shortly after that and shared their findings and samples with their superiors. The leather-bound book retrieved by Agent Nowak and Agent Bakula was given to SCP Foundation linguistic expert researcher Albin Iskra. Researcher Iskra quickly became enraptured with the book and the unique challenge it and its proto-Slavic dialect presented. After many long nights of poring over books on Slavic linguistic history and many pots of very strong coffee, researcher Iskra's work finally bore fruit. In a note to other personnel working on the SCP-6198 case, she wrote, Let me start by saying that, despite my extensive knowledge of the history and origins of Slavic language, this is the first time I've ever encountered what appears to be proto-Slavic in written form from a direct descendant source. This is a truly fascinating discovery. Initial progress on translating the text was slower than expected. There's something about the linguistic structure of the language that, for reasons I can't fully deduce, make it incredibly difficult to retain the knowledge of. For every few words committed to memory, it's as though one dissipates from it. It's as if I can feel a sense of reluctance coming from the language itself. Eventually, I was able to solidify my understanding enough to begin picking at the various passages found throughout. I can confirm that the contents of the book hold a great deal of religious significance, not only for those in Chemnost, but throughout all Slavic culture, dating back to roughly the 4th century. While there are references to the more well-known Slavic gods such as Perun and Veles, the book focuses primarily on one of the sibling successor gods, Chernobog, the Black God, detailing various prayers, rituals, and tenets that followers of the Black God should live by and practice. I've highlighted a selection of excerpts of notable interest that may shed some light on the occurrences witnessed by Foundation personnel. Three areas of interest in researcher Iskra's translation are the Rite of the Black Passage, Expurgation and the Black Gift, and the Fall of Velas, each of which, in their own way, shed some light and some darkness on the cryptic happenings of Chemnost. The section on the Rite of the Black Passage read, For it is to him where the dead must go and return to the roiling abyss from which our forms are molded to be one again with him. In this, we share in their fathomless knowledge and learn of untold and forgotten epics, unfurling mysteries of Stygian transcendence bestowed with blessings beyond death. At darkest hour, on darkest night, within lamented dwelling hollows, shall Hypogean thresholds unveil entwining submerged departed. Now relinquished of tethers corporeal and sustained amidst black waters, become one with perennial ancestry, granting insight to those adherent. The section marked Expurgation and the Black Gift read, There are those that only turn to Chernobog when their time is at an end, and it is those that shall be offered the least when they inevitably pass. To live solely in the light of the brother is to neglect the eternity that follows, condemning oneself to the lowest echelons of consciousness. Those with wisdom and foresight do well to embrace the black gift, to forfeit a part of oneself in exchange for parts of the many. To drink of the black gift is to offer one's life in a bid to be tested of mind and spirit. Should one be deemed worthy, that which was offered will be returned, but with boundless acuity and vigor. Should one's offering fall short, their essence is given to the black god entirely. Yet, the truer they walk the black path, the more openly their soul shall be welcomed. Before one is to be tested, they must first be expurgated through ritual, else any sense of self is lost upon passing. This ebonizes the soul, proving devotion to the black path and allowing one's essence to find greater connection upon being taken in by Chernobog. The ritual must be carried out by followers in the living realm now sustained by the black gift, with these followers bringing about a trance of blindness and drowning within the aspirant. Should an aspirant prove resolute throughout this trial of panic terror and asphyxiation, the black gift is then offered and true judgment begins. And finally, the section labeled The Fall of Velas offers a mythological origin for the black god Chernobog himself. It read, Velas, god of the harvest, livestock, earth, rivers, the underworld, magic, and trickery. Much did humanity depend upon him for not only the means to survive, but also for peaceful death. Alas, where there are those with great power, there are also those that seek to claim it for themselves. And in this, brothers Bellabog and Chernobog were no different. Harsh winter followed by foul harvest led to the death of the brothers' village, 
leaving the dead unburied atop frozen ground. Enraged at the neglect Velas had dealt them, and adamant that between them they could govern the lands of the living and the dead better than the great god, the brothers set out in search of Velas, their minds intent on deicide. In their journeys, the brothers overcome many challenges, redoubling their affinity in magic and honing their cunning in warfare, Belabog excelling in martial guile as Chernabog mastered the spell. However, Velas watched the brothers, aware of their quest. In a bid to undermine them, Velas returned the body of their mother to the living world to convince them to return home with her. The brothers were not fooled, and with a heavy heart, returned their mother to the underworld. Velas continued to break their will, turning the food they gathered rotten. But again, the brothers were not fooled, as they endured putrid delusion of smell and taste, knowing that in truth what they consumed would nourish them. Every trick cast down by Velas was foreseen and averted, until eventually, frustrated at the brothers' tenacity, Velas himself confronted Belabog and Chernabog. Velas challenged the brothers to battle, offering his godhood should they best him, but on the condition that only one may fight him. Suspecting that Velas may attempt to divide the two, the brothers had made a pact with Perun, Velas's adversary. The brothers agreed that Velas would indeed fight only a single combatant, to which Velas acknowledged and drew up a boundary from which to battle within. When asked who shall fight, the brothers announced Perun, and upon uttering his name, the god of thunder appeared with a great flash within the boundary. A battle of world-shattering magnitude commenced as Velas took the form of a dragon and Perun harnessed the power of the skies. Despite his skill in magic and deceit, Velas was struck down and killed by Perun. With Velas dead, Belabog claimed domain over harvest, the earth, and livestock, as Chernabog claimed the underworld, the rivers, and magic. Combining information from these extracts with contextual information they'd gathered from observation allowed them to paint a more complete picture of the goings-on at Chemnost, as well as SCP-6198 itself. But to develop an even greater understanding of what they were dealing with here, they'd need to open a dialogue with a friendly member of the village. That villager ended up being Tessia Konieczny, a woman who appeared to be middle-aged but was, in actuality, in her mid-70s. Her youthful, outward appearance owing to the positive effects of the Black Gift. Tessia was pleasant and forthcoming with her information as Foundation researchers questioned her, allowing them to glean a variety of interesting information. For example, the Black Gift is exclusive to those who were born in Chemnost, and many worshippers used to make their pilgrimage to Chemnost to pledge their bodies to Chernabog in their final moments and become one with him. Tessia also seemed to possess information that either would have predated her life or would be impossible for her to know, suggesting a shared consciousness between those who had been given the Black Gift. The question of what it exactly meant to offer oneself to Chernabog continued to linger, until the Foundation began to conduct tests with the samples collected by Agent Nowak and Agent Bakula. Given that, supposedly, only people born in Chemnost could receive the Black Gift, the Foundation was eager to discover what effect the Black Liquid might have on a D-Class. Incidentally, despite being truly opaque in any quantity, chemical tests showed that the composition of the black liquid was no different from water. So how severe could the effects really be? When a sample was applied to a D-Class subject's skin, there were no noticeable effects, nor were there any when the D-Class was submerged up to the neck in the substance. When given diving equipment and entirely submerged in the liquid, still nothing happened. However, when the D-Class was instructed to drink a glass of the liquid, he became incredibly ill, his veins and then skin turning black. He quickly expired, and his body rapidly decomposed into more of the same black liquid. This implied that it was all part of the life cycle of Chemnost. The black gift sustains life, but when life finally comes to an end, everyone rejoins Chernabog and becomes the same black liquid that sustains the next generation of worshippers. Also, when a sample was given to a Chemnost native to drink, there were no noticeable effects. After all this, the SCP Foundation decided it was finally time to lower a member of their own personnel into one of the SCP-6198 chasms to better figure out what was inside. This, however, was the beginning of the troubles that would alert the Foundation to the true danger presented by SCP-6198 and his worshippers. Researcher Ella Gorsky agreed to suit up and be lowered into the blackness of one of the chasms and report back what happened within. As expected, when she was lowered in, she reported the eerie darkness around her and the black liquid that seemed to almost have a mind of its own. When they attempted to pull her out, there was evidence of spatial distortion, as despite being theoretically raised enough to leave the underwater cavern, 
she was still down there. It was at this point that researcher Gorski began to talk to someone who wasn't there concerning the research staff up above. When they tried to raise her, they realized that something was terribly wrong. Researcher Gorski was gone. She'd been absorbed, body and mind, into the great collective consciousness of Chernobog. The entity begged in Gorski's voice, there is nothing of interest to be found within this abyss. The only knowledge worth seeking is above us. Please send more foundation. Please, I must survive. This was how the SCP Foundation gleaned another extremely valuable piece of information. Chernobog is able to grow stronger based on his number of victims and worshippers, as more minds and memories are absorbed into his great collective consciousness. And disturbingly, after consuming researcher Gorski, he knew about the SCP Foundation, and he was extremely, extremely eager to know more. This was when things took a turn for the worst. In the hours following the disappearance of researcher Gorski, a mobile task force unit was dispatched from Site 120 to assist in the search. As they searched, various townsfolk approached Foundation staff and began questioning them on subjects that they had no business knowing about, such as the fate of researcher Gorski, the status of various anomalies in the region, and the location of the O5 Council, which led Foundation agents to detaining the villager who asked that last particularly dangerous question. But the worst was yet to come. The Foundation first had to stop a bizarre ritual where some of the villagers began taking bucketfuls of water from the village well and bringing it to the different houses, and it took intervention from the mobile task force unit on site to get them to stop. And not long after that, one of the MTF members, Agent Adam Kowalski, didn't report back for duty. The remaining MTF members began searching for their missing colleague, but at the same time, villagers also began attacking the task force members at the cemetery, forcing them to fight their way back into town. When the embattled group entered a suspicious house, they found a startling sight. A room filled with dark chasms surrounded by makeshift paintings of the SCP Foundation's logo. Further in, they discovered Agent Kowalski laying on the ground with two villagers appearing to pray over him. When nothing else would make them stop, they were forced to neutralize the two villagers and retrieve the comatose Agent Kowalski for evacuation from the village. The villagers crowded around the center of the village as the MTF members approached with Kowalski in tow. After being forced to kill several more villagers, the crowd finally parted and allowed them through. During the car ride out of the village, Agent Kowalski briefly became semi-lucid and muttered about something black watching him from beneath the water. He was able to provide no other information on what had happened to him, and just moments later, he died of cardiac arrest. Security footage would then show something extremely disturbing occurring within the MTF vehicle. Agent Kowalski's dead body sat up, retrieved his gun, and then killed his fellow MTF squadmates before they even had a chance to react. The driver of the car was seriously wounded and the vehicle crashed. Agent Kowalski's reanimated body then exited the vehicle and screaming could be heard as he pulled the injured driver from his seat and dragged him away into the darkness. The sounds of begging, vomiting, and wheezing were heard after that as we can only assume he was forced to ingest the black gift. No bodies were ever recovered, just various MTF uniforms floating in black liquid near the road sign. Since this incident, the SCP Foundation has dealt with the village of Chemnost and SCP-6198 with increased caution. Agent Kowalski's reanimated corpse remains at large, and regular searches are conducted for it in the Lower Silesian Forest since it is vital, above all else, that Chernobog cannot come to know any more sensitive SCP Foundation information than he already does. Due to his intelligent nature and capacity to learn and exploit SCP Foundation secrets, Chernobog has been given the Euclid Object Class, and files pertaining to Chernobog are classified to Level 3 personnel and above. The entity has been given the disruption class Vlam, as it is thankfully currently localized entirely to the village of Chemnost, Poland. And given the recent events that have unfolded there, it has also been given the risk class Caution, since there's no way of knowing what the Black God still has up his sleeve. As you can clearly see, this completely throws our entire understanding of our place in the universe into complete disarray, says the astronomer as he excitedly makes his case to a panel of aged and supposedly learned advisors. My observations leave no doubt that everything we previously suspected to be the absolute truth is wrong. The panel of advisors murmur and lean close together to whisper to each other. The astronomer can't hear what they are saying, but the passion and joy that he felt as he explained his findings to the room is quickly draining from his face. 
He can see the men mouthing the words, no, and lies, as they make disapproving gestures. But how could this be? Had they not understood what he was showing them? Maybe he didn't explain things in a way that they could comprehend. Here he was, the greatest scientist of his day, presenting hard facts, backed up by rigorous observations, and this was their reaction. The group of advisors finish conferring and grow quiet. The chief advisor clears his throat, and everyone in the room waits for him to speak. Royal scientist, this panel has examined your findings and listened to your theories. The advisor can't help but sneer at the word and has decided that the ideas you present are not only incorrect, but dangerous. The astronomer can't believe what he's hearing. This panel, acting under the authority of the king, has charged you with the crime of heresy. The astronomer is shocked. He steps towards the panel to plead with them, but he's stopped by a pair of guards who grab him by the arms. Stop! Stop! I'm a man of science! I only presented you with the truth! But no one seems moved by his appeals. The panel watches as the astronomer is dragged from the room, kicking and fighting, still insisting on his innocence. The screams echo through the dungeon as the torturer cranks another notch on the rack, stretching the astronomer's body just a little bit more. He has no idea how long this has been going on. Hours? Days? The pain has been excruciating and without end. He closes his eyes, trying to escape the torture by retreating into his mind but he's slapped on the face and brought back to the reality of his situation. Standing in front of him is the chief advisor, the same one who sentenced him to this inhumane treatment. You can end this any time you like. Simply recant your statements and admit you were mistaken, and all of this will be over. The astronomer is unsure if by over he means that they will release him, or simply kill him to put him out of his misery. But it didn't matter which the right answer was, he couldn't lie. The astronomer knew the truth, and no amount of pain, no matter how intense or how long they submitted him to it, would change what he now knew. Disappointed with the astronomer's steadfastness, the advisor signals to the torturer, who cranks the rack again, stretching the astronomer's body to the point where he feels like his bones might pop out of their sockets. Recant, the advisor screams, repeating the word over and over, growing louder as the astronomer's own cries increase from the pain caused by the torturer cranking the rack more and more. The astronomer closes his eyes again. He's certain this will be the end of him soon, and that he will die with the great secret he's learned without getting the chance to share it with the world. But suddenly, the astronomer notices that the room has gone quiet. The advisor is no longer yelling, and the torturer has stopped operating the machine. The astronomer opens his eyes to see the advisor and the torturer both in a deep bow. His gaze continues up and he sees the king himself standing in front of him. The king stares at the astronomer for what feels like an eternity before simply asking, is it true? The astronomer, limbs still stretched on the rack, manages a nod and with his remaining strength whispers, it's true. The king motions with his hand to the torturer, who stands up and begins releasing the astronomer from his constraints. The advisor protests, but my lord, this man… But he's cut off by the king with a stern look and retreats back into his deep bow. Show me, the king says as the astronomer stands, rubbing his sore shoulders where the tendons and muscles were stretched far beyond their natural limits. The astronomer opens the door to his laboratory and gestures for the king to enter. The room is a mess of papers and scientific equipment, a reflection of the busy and scattered mind of the man who works here. The king is immediately drawn to a table with a large scroll. He spreads it across the table and examines it, but his face betrays no hint of what he is thinking. Is this what you showed my advisors? The astronomer nods yes. Would you like to see for yourself? The astronomer motions to the window, where a brass tube is attached to a tripod. The king approaches the device, but doesn't know how it works. The astronomer demonstrates by looking through the eyepiece. He moves it slightly, making small adjustments to make sure it is just right for the king. There, now look. The king bends over to peer through the telescope, and a look of shock comes over his face. What he sees is the most incredible thing he has ever witnessed. There, far above up in the sky, unable to be seen by the naked eye, is a man, and he is staring back at him. The planet that this played out on was not Earth, but a bizarre place that is one of the strangest anomalies in the entire SCP Foundation archive. This is SCP-007, 
also known as Abdominal Planet. SCP-007 is a spherical object located in the abdomen of a young man, or rather in the space where his abdomen should be, since most of the muscle, skin, and organs that should be present simply are not. The subject, a Caucasian male in his mid-twenties of average height and build, does not appear affected by the large missing portion of his body, and has not reported experiencing pain or discomfort of any kind. In the space where his abdominal muscles and organs should be is a small globe composed of soil and water. This sphere, which measures roughly 60 centimeters in diameter, resembles the planet Earth, though the arrangement of the continents does not match any known configuration from our own planet's history. The tiny planet has its own weather patterns and even a small but still detectable gravitational pull. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of SCP-007 is that it appears to be inhabited Microscopic organisms that would correspond to roughly the scale of human beings on Earth have been observed on the surface of the planet. So far, two distinct intelligent species have been identified, both of whom seem to possess a technological level similar to the 15th century on Earth. It is unknown if the inhabitants of the abdominal planet are aware of the world outside of their planet, and communication attempts with the planet's occupants have been placed on hold by senior Foundation officials, pending further study into what effect an exchange may have on them or us. The human subject within which SCP-007 is located provided the Foundation with a name that he claims to be his, but no records of such a person existing have yet to be located. Upon being questioned about the lack of records, he willfully offered both a social security and driver's license number, but when they were checked against current records, neither had yet to be assigned by the US government. And the mysteries surrounding this man don't stop there. The subject has not shown the need for either food or water, and it is unknown what energy source his body continues to operate on without nutrition. He is capable of both eating and drinking though, despite the large missing section of his stomach, but it is still not known what happens to the substances after he swallows them. The man has above average intelligence and scored a 128 on an administered IQ test. He also generally appears friendly and amiable and expresses only a passing curiosity about the planet located within his abdomen and how it came to be there. When asked about the origins of the planet, he replied very matter-of-factly that, I just woke up one day and there it was. I don't have any idea how it got there. Due to the poorly understood nature of SCP-007, it has been classified as Euclid, and the small planet and the man it resides in are contained in a sealed, comfortably furnished 10 by 10 meter room that the subject is not allowed to leave. The subject is to be monitored closely by Foundation staff and has a weekly chess game with one of the attending doctors, which also serves as an opportunity to evaluate his mental health. So far, he has not shown any signs of mental illness or violent tendencies and seems to be quite content. In general, he appears happy with his restricted living situation inside the Foundation facility and has made no attempts to escape. The subject has made multiple requests for access to a computer with an internet connection, but due to potential security risks, this request has thus far been denied. A young man and his girlfriend enter the apartment they share. She tosses her keys on the entryway table as the man checks the time on his phone. He reminds the young woman that they will need to leave soon if they don't want to miss the movie they have purchased tickets for. The woman agrees, but she wants to take a quick shower before they leave. As she goes to freshen up, the man sits down at his computer to get in a quick round or two of his favorite online squad-based first-person shooter. He puts on his headset and jumps into a game. Before he knows it, he's just finished his third round. He checks the time on his phone again and realizes that they were running late. He takes off his headphones and is confused when he hears what sounds like the shower still running. He gets up and goes to the bathroom door and listens. The shower is definitely still on. The man knocks on the door and asks if everything is alright. He waits a moment, but there's no response. He knocks again, and still, nothing. She doesn't usually take showers this long, and he immediately worries that she might have passed out or well, he doesn't even want to think about it. I'm coming in, okay? He announces as he opens the door to check on her. The man immediately notices how steamy the room is. The hot water must have been running for a while, and he's worried she really did pass out from the heat. What's going on, are you okay? He asks, and when there's no response again, he pulls open the shower curtain to find… nothing. Just an empty tub. There's no sign of his girlfriend anywhere. The man is beyond confused. He turns off the water and goes to the bedroom, but she isn't in there either. He runs to the front door, but it's still locked, and her keys are sitting on the table. 
He unlocks the door and sticks his head out into the hallway anyway, but nothing is out there. What is going on? He checks the bedroom again, then the bathroom, but she hasn't suddenly reappeared in either. He's in complete shock, unsure of what could be happening. He sits down on the toilet and puts his head in his hands. His head is spinning as it feels like the world is suddenly falling down all around him. The police are immediately suspicious of the man's story. His girlfriend simply vanished while taking a shower? You expect us to believe that? The detective asks. The man has no answer, though. It's as if she simply blinked out of existence. He's convinced she must still be in the building somewhere, that she somehow slipped out without him noticing. But none of the security footage from inside the building shows anything abnormal. There's footage from the cameras in the lobby of them entering the building, but nothing after that of her leaving. Just as in every missing person case like this, the boyfriend is the number one suspect. But without any evidence, they can't hold him any longer. After many long hours of interviews, they finally allow him to leave, but not back to the apartment, since it's an active crime scene. The man has no family to speak of, and his few friends seem to have the same suspicions as the police and want nothing to do with him. His girlfriend was the only person he truly had in the world, and now she's gone. He's put up in a shabby motel, and days pass, then weeks, then months, but no evidence of the missing woman ever turns up. The man replays the memory of that day over and over in his head, searching for some kind of answer, but try as he might, he can't remember anything helpful, no clue as to what could have happened. The case is completely cold, and has been from the very start. The police eventually have to move on to newer, more solvable cases, and they finally allow the man to return home. He's overwhelmed with emotion the first time he enters the apartment. The place is a mess. It looks like the police turned it inside out looking for clues. Not knowing what else to do, he starts the long process of cleaning up the apartment. After hours of putting things away, he eventually gathers the strength to go to the one room he's been avoiding, the bathroom. He opens the door to the last place he's certain his girlfriend was. He enters to find that it looks like the rest of the apartment, as if someone has looked at every single object but just like him, the police never found any trace of where she went. After straightening up this last room, he decides that he should take a shower and go to bed. It fills him with dread to think about standing in the last place he knows where she was, but he's had months to grieve the loss of his girlfriend, and he's decided that he needs to move on, whatever that means when someone goes missing without a trace. He turns on the shower and lets the water heat up before stepping in. Once he's in, every thought he has is about her. He wonders if she ever actually got in the shower at all, or somehow used it as a diversion to slip out unseen. He just can't figure out how. The day's events race through his mind, just as they have a thousand times before, but his thoughts are interrupted when he notices that the water has started to pool around his feet. He looks down and sees that the drain cover looks normal. Maybe there's a clog, though. Do showers clog when they're not used? He has no idea. He bends down to get a closer look. The long, black creature emerges from the drain in the blink of an eye and latches onto his mouth, muffling him before he even has a chance to scream. He struggles and pulls down the curtain on top of him as he falls back onto the shower floor. But it's already too late, and in a matter of minutes, he too will be gone without a trace. Is there anything more comforting after a hard day than a nice, long, hot shower? The answer to that is no, there is nothing better. But that relaxing shower might just be the last you ever take when unbeknownst to you, your pipes are home to an instance of SCP-153, also known as drain worms. SCP-153 refers to a species that resembles the common nematode, or roundworm, consisting of a long, thin body with a large mouth on one end. While some roundworms can grow to as large as a meter long, which is in itself a disturbing thought, SCP-153 instances can be much, much larger and it is estimated that they can reach up to nearly 10 meters in length, though it is hypothesized that some instances in the wild may grow even longer. These worm-like creatures will feed off of any available organic material. However, their favorite form of sustenance is fresh animal tissue, and they appear to have an especially strong predilection towards human flesh. In order to satiate their desire to feed on their preferred prey, SCP-153 has developed a rather unique predatory style that perfectly suits its elongated body structure. While it is unknown just where they originate, they are most often found in the pipes of sewer and drainage systems. 153 instances will swim up those pipes, seeking out ones that lead to people's homes, and especially those that connect to showers and bathtubs. Once they reach the end of the pipe, 
SCP-153 will latch onto the drain cover and begin secreting an acidic substance. The acid quickly dissolves the drain cover, and SCP-153 will position its own mouth in its place, which it then is able to camouflage as the missing drain cover almost perfectly. Once SCP-153 has taken this position, it is virtually impossible to distinguish it from the original or discern that anything has changed. SCP-153 will then lie in wait until it detects that someone has entered the shower or bathtub. Once the unsuspecting person has begun to bathe, it will very quickly emerge from the drain, latching onto the victim's face, most likely in order to prevent them from calling for help. It then begins to rapidly secrete more of the same acid that it used to dissolve the drain cover. With how effectively it was able to dissolve metal, it's no surprise that SCP-153 is able to quickly produce the same effect on its victim. Their skin, muscle, and bone will all be almost immediately liquefied, allowing SCP-153 to feed on the slurry, and the drain worms feed extremely quickly as well. After just several minutes, basically nothing will remain of the person who stepped into the shower, and 153 will retreat back into the drain, leaving no signs that it was ever there, save for the missing drain cover. The SCP Foundation became aware of this anomaly following multiple mysterious missing person cases that all had one key element in common. Each was reported as having disappeared after entering a bathroom to either shower or take a bath. The Foundation soon discovered that large populations of SCP-153 instances were living in the sewers beneath several major American cities and immediately began enacting containment procedures. The Foundation collected as many specimens as they could and brought them to Bio Research Area 12 where they keep them contained in 10 by 10 by 5 meter tanks that are kept partially filled with sewage and other organic material for them to feed on. Of course, it is of the utmost importance that these containers are never connected to any other plumbing systems, either internal or external. With several specimens contained, the Foundation began researching the creatures in order to hopefully better understand them and how they were able to develop such complex hunting techniques. Research was also approved to find out whether they could be used as a sort of waste disposal system in certain extreme circumstances, such as with SCP-2717, a mass of living animal tissue that has grown to line nearly four kilometers of sewer pipes beneath Amsterdam. A small number of SCP-153 instances were approved for release into the wild in order to test whether they could stall the spread of 2717. However, this experiment was halted following some disturbing new reports. More missing person reports came to the Foundation's attention that bore the hallmarks of an SCP-153 attack, but these new reports were not limited to people who vanished after bathing. It now appears that SCP-153 has further adapted and has begun to emerge not just from showers and bathtub drains, but now also from sinks and, yes, even toilets. The Foundation is unaware of just how many instances of SCP-153 continue to exist in the wild there's no doubt that many continue to live and hunt undetected in sewers around the world. This anomaly, which has been classified as Euclid, is taken very seriously by the Foundation, and any reports of people who go missing from bathrooms are immediately investigated for signs of SCP-153. Field agents are to be equipped with infrared and ultraviolet sensors which can bypass SCP-153's camouflage, and if specimens are able to be captured alive, then they are to be brought to Area 12 for further research. But don't bother worrying too much the next time you step into the tub. If you've been targeted by SCP-153, there's not much you'll be able to do anyway, and your worries will soon be going down the drain, along with whatever remains of you. Two recreational divers are swimming along the seafloor nearly a hundred feet below the surface. This husband and wife duo are no strangers to scuba diving, and they move effortlessly through the water as they marvel at the various fish and plant life that normally remain unseen by humans. The woman taps her husband on the shoulder and points in the direction of a forest of kelp before starting to swim towards it. The man is about to follow when he sees something out of the corner of his eye. He stops and turns to get a better look. A few dozen meters away is a group of people. The man is confused. He looks back towards his wife, who is motioning for him to follow her. He raises a single finger as if to say, I'll be with you in a minute, and starts to swim in the direction of the strange crowd of people standing on the seafloor. He still can't make out exactly what he's looking at. A light current is causing silt to kick up and hang in the air, obscuring his view. As he gets closer though, everything becomes clear. It really is a group of people, standing perfectly still, 30 meters underwater. But they aren't living people, of course. They are statues. The man can see now that these are statues of children. 
They are standing in a circle, facing outwards, and each one is holding hands with the statues next to them, forming an unbroken ring. He swims closer to get a better look. The statues are covered in algae and other plant life. He doesn't know who or why someone would make this strange art piece, but whatever their reasons, it looks like it's been down here a long time. He swims around the circle and counts more than 20 in total, with each one looking to be unique. While the center of the circle of statues is empty, there's pieces of bricks and concrete scattered all around it. Did there used to be something down here? A building or some kind of structure that once housed the statues and has now collapsed? It seems impossible that anything could have ever been built down here. He looks back in the direction of his wife, but he can't see her. She must be somewhere along the kelp investigating her own mysteries. He's about to head in her direction when he notices something. The inside of the circle isn't empty. Something is inside, sticking out of the sand. He swims up above the ring to get a better look. There's definitely something buried in the circle of statues. He can see now that it is the corner of what looks to be a metal box. He swims down closer to the box and reaches a hand out towards it, when he suddenly stops and looks up. The woman swims out of the dense kelp forest carrying a brightly colored shell. She can't wait to show her husband how beautiful it is. She looks around, but there's no sign of him. She looks in the direction that he swam and spots the same strange group of people that he did. As she swims towards them, she also quickly realizes that these are just statues. Very odd ones, but statues nonetheless. She also notices the rubble that surrounds them. The broken chunks of concrete, bricks, some bones… wait, bones? That's when she spots something else lying on the ocean floor just outside the ring of statues. It's her husband's scuba tank, with his shattered mask resting on top. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-1451, also known as Sunken Children's Perimeter. SCP-1451 is the designation that has been given to an anomalous set of metal statues that possess very strange and deadly properties. The 26 statues, each of which is unique and have been given the designations SCP-1451-1 through 26, all resemble human children and range in height from 1.32 to 1.43 meters. They are located within an ocean inlet on the seafloor and are arranged in a circle facing outwards, with each holding hands with the ones next to it, forming an unbroken ring. These statues are anything but stationary though, at least some of the time, and in fact they have three distinct stages of motion, which the SCP Foundation refers to as Class 1 through 3 scenarios. The first, a Class 1 scenario is the designation given when no movement is detected at all. This is the state that the statues appear to spend the majority of their time in. The designation will change to Class 2 when some slight movement of the statues is detected. In this state, they can be seen to slowly raise and lower their hands, while also subtly moving together in a counterclockwise direction. Bubbles have been observed coming from the statues' mouths during this scenario. SCP-1451 will be seen to behave this way when a large object comes near it and it will often mean that the statues are preparing to transition into a Class 3 scenario. A Class 3 scenario will be triggered when a solid object that weighs more than 40 grams enters the center of the circle. When the object, whether it be a living one or not, enters this activation area, the statues will fully animate and turn their attention on the object with only one purpose – to destroy it. When the statues enter a Class 3 scenario, they exhibit incredible strength and agility. They appear to possess at least a rudimentary form of intelligence as well, as they have been seen utilizing teamwork and advanced tactics. Once the statues have been activated, they are relentless in the pursuit of their targets, stopping at nothing to neutralize them. Should you manage to make it out of the activation area, the statues will still continue to give chase, and in one case, they followed a target over a kilometer before finally overtaking it. Once they get their hands on a target, death and destruction are all but assured. They will rip and tear anything that enters their circle apart, be it man or machine, with their metallic hands. Once they have eliminated the object, the statues will then return to their Class 1 scenario position. Attempts to intercept the statues as they return to their activation area will lead to what the Foundation has dubbed a Class 3.5 scenario, during which they will destroy anyone or anything that tries to intervene or prevent them from reaching their destination. While SCP-1451 might seem to be one of the simpler anomalies in the SCP Foundation database, there may just be more to this story than first meets the eye. And in fact, the sunken children's perimeter may not even be the first anomaly that was contained here. 
those with Foundation Overseer level clearance have access to some rather interesting documents that help to fill in just what SCP-1451 might really be, and more importantly, what they're protecting. The documents include a manifest of the materials that were initially recovered from the area where SCP-1451 was discovered. These materials included roughly 20 kilograms of bricks, 4,000 kilograms of containment-grade concrete, the type normally used in SCP Foundation sites, and most interesting of all, a damaged Scranton box. For those unaware, Scranton boxes were the precursors to Dr. Scranton's much better known reality anchors. These powerful devices are used to contain reality warping anomalies and prevent them from bending the fabric of our universe to their whims. Dr. Scranton's initial research into the technology produced an early version that was used in the containment of anomalies, though we now know that the technology was flawed and could lead to failures in containment. In the case of SCP-1451, a document was partially recovered from the Scranton box that alludes to just such a failure. In this instance, a powerful Euclid-class reality warper was being held at Area 56, a location that the Foundation has no record of ever having existed. The corrupted file seems to suggest that the reality warping SCP's primary anomalous attribute was that things it believed to be real would become real. If it misconceived reality in any way, its anomalous abilities would force that misconception to become actual reality. For example, after the anomalous entity referred to an agent assigned to its containment as a child, the agent was at risk of undergoing various physical and mental changes to truly become a child. It appears that the anomaly may have begun conflating various aspects of its containment, mixing up the concepts of containment itself. The metal of its cage, the concrete of its cell, the child agent involved with its containment, the SCP Foundation itself, they all became entangled within the reality warping anomaly's mind and appear to have been jumbled together in such a way that led to the creation of SCP-1451, a group of metal children who are eternally on guard and destroy anything that tries to breach their perimeter. Just what happened to Area 56, the personnel who were stationed there, or the powerful reality warping anomaly they contained, continues to be a mystery. SCP-1451 has been classified as Euclid and is considered to be effectively contained at its current location. A sphere of wire mesh netting has been erected around it in order to ensure that no objects enter its activation area, but in the event that an object does manage to enter the circle, the statues are to be remotely monitored and no attempts whatsoever are to be made to try and rescue the person or object that triggered the Class 3 scenario. The 13-year-old boy gets a running start before leaping across from one moss-covered boulder to another. He barely makes the jump and turns around to admire how far he leaped. He continues along through the woods, hopping over streams and making sure to swing on any hanging vines he can find, whether he needs to or not. He picks up a branch and starts to swing it against a tree, engaging in a life-and-death duel with the evil knight of the woods. After slaying the knight, the boy solemnly salutes his fallen foe before mounting his trusty steed to ride deeper into the forest. He's all alone out here and must be thousands of miles from civilization. The valiant knight unmounts from his horse and walks towards the culmination of his quest, the Tree of Lost Memories. Legend tells that anything buried beneath this tree will cease to exist. All memories of anything associated with the object buried will disappear from the minds of anyone involved, and no one will ever bring them up again or wonder where the memories went. The knight takes a letter sealed with wax from where he was keeping it safely inside of his armor and kneels in front of the tree. He brushes the leaves and dirt away from a spot near the base of the tree and digs a small hole with his hands before placing the letter inside the hole. The boy looks down at the letter, satisfied with his work. He starts covering the letter inside the hole with dirt when he suddenly stands up. Was that a noise? He listens again. It's not just a noise, it's a voice. The knight unsheathes his sword and starts making his way in the direction he can hear the sounds coming from. He follows a game trail through the woods towards the noise. There's no doubt, it's definitely a voice, and he can make it out clearly now. The wheel of history turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. The knight rounds a corner, and the woods open up into a clearing. In the middle of the grassy open area is a stone archway unconnected to any walls. When looking through the archway, though, one doesn't simply see the other side of the clearing. No, inside the archway is a beautiful white alabaster castle perched on rock overlooking the sea, its red-roofed turrets jutting high up into the clouds. And standing next to the archway that seems to lead to another land is an old man 
dressed in a long flowing robe, a wizard's robe. The boy steps out of the woods into the clearing. What is this old man doing out here? And what's going on with this archway? It really does look like it is showing something it shouldn't be able to. Legends fade to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. Are you talking to me? The boy asks. Venture forth and face your true calling, the wizard responds. You are the one that has been prophesied, but have you what it takes to enter this land of adventure? The boy looks around. There's no one else here. This old man must be speaking to him, right? The boy tosses his stick to the ground and steps closer to the old man in the archway. He can see now that the surface of the archway appears to be shimmering, as if it were a vertical surface of water. Only the truest of hearts may enter the magical archway, but for the fair and brave, a great quest awaits. A quest? For me? The boy asks, but again, the old man doesn't respond. He doesn't seem to be looking at him either. Is this wise old man in the woods blind? The boy gets much closer now, close enough to wave his hand in front of the old man's face, but there's no reaction. He really must be blind. The boy looks back at the portal in the archway. He can see the waves breaking on the rocks and birds flying in the sky. He can even make out, up in one of the highest windows on the tallest tower, what looks to be a... a girl. She's waving her ribbon in the air. She's beckoning him. She needs the brave knight to come save her. Pursue your destiny and become the hero you were always meant to be. The boy is entranced by the beauty of this land, the castle, the clouds drifting between the white towers, the perfectly blue sea, and the beautiful princess locked in her tower, waiting for him. The boy reaches his hand through the surface of the archway, and it passes through as if nothing were there. But on the other side, it turns into the gauntleted hand of a knight. He pulls his hand back out, and it looks like his own hand once again. The boy thinks about his mother, yelling at him for drawing pictures of the lands he wished he could live in when he should be studying. He thinks of his teacher grabbing the fantasy book out of his hand and dropping it in the trash, calling it a waste of time. He thinks of his friends laughing when he came to school dressed as a knight. He knew he was destined for something greater. And here it finally is. He really is a knight. He's the hero that was prophesied. He will become a legend. He's special. The knight girds himself and steps forward into the archway. As he does, he hears the old man still talking. The wheel of history turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that... The boy passes through the archway, and the castle, the sea, the princess, all of them disappear in an instant. The boy spins around, but the archway constricts, snapping shut in a tight ball with him still inside. The old man sinks to the ground as the archway seems to rotate. The archway then also disappears into the earth as something else emerges. A giant centipede appears out of the ground, its scaly body the color of stone with movable plates on its posterior end that resembles the movement of cloth. The centipede opens its mouth, and there's a sound like the cry of a child before it dives down and disappears under the dirt. Have you ever thought that you were destined for something more? Do you feel as if the worlds described in fantasy books and that are brought to life in movies and in video games are somehow the places you actually belong? You're far from alone, but be careful, because it's exactly those thoughts that make you the prime target for SCP-4310, a deadly predator that preys on those with the desire to embark on a hero's journey. SCP-4310 is an anomalous creature that resembles a common centipede in many ways, though it has a number of traits that distinguish it from the kind you might find under a rock in the forest. Perhaps most obvious is its size. While some centipedes can grow as long as a foot, SCP-4310 is over 20 feet in length. This massive carnivorous centipede, which is native to Great Britain and Ireland, also has a hunting method that is quite distinct from any arthropod, insect, or known animal at all for that matter. SCP-4310 hunts by cocooning itself in a pair of keratin flaps that cover its entire body except for its tail end, which is left exposed. The centipede then buries itself in the ground, keeping its head and the majority of its body under the ground, except for a portion that arcs above the ground in a semicircle shape, as well as its exposed posterior. The centipede's end resembles an old man wearing robes, and the centipede is able to manipulate its rear legs in a way that resembles the movement of a mouth and jaw giving the impression that the old man is speaking. 
the rest of its body is contorted, and the legs are arranged in such a way to resemble a stone archway standing unsupported on the ground next to the old man. Through a process that is yet to be understood by the Foundation, the centipede is able to produce a spatial anomaly in the area where its body is taking on the form of an archway. This spatial anomaly is actually a portal of sorts, a portal that leads directly into SCP-4310's stomach. As soon as its prey enters the spatial anomaly, the centipede closes the portal. Inside, paralysis-inducing enzymes incapacitate the prey as powerful stomach acids break down its meal over the course of several days. You may be thinking, I would never walk into an archway next to an old man in the middle of the forest, but SCP-4310 has two powerful mechanisms perfectly suited to luring its prey. First, it is capable of emitting a pheromone that induces a state of mild euphoria while at the same time suppressing fear and encouraging curiosity. This appears to affect all warm-blooded mammals, but humans and their natural inclination towards exploration makes them especially vulnerable to the effects. The second method 4310 utilizes to acquire food is producing a very unique set of sounds. These sounds, which are made by rubbing together portions inside of its tail segment, resemble English speech and are almost always phrases that describe quests, prophecies, and heroic deeds that can only be undertaken by journeying into the archway. SCP-4310 calls can last for as long as three minutes before they begin to repeat the series of heroic phrases and each instance of SCP-4310 appears to have its own unique set of calls to embark on adventure, but with all encouraging entrance into the archway. It is unknown just how SCP-4310 learns these phrases, since other than this advanced hunting technique, no instance of the anomalous creature has shown intelligence levels above that of an ordinary centipede. Interestingly, the same heroic speech sounds appear to also act as SCP-4310's mating call, and it is unknown if the luring of would-be adventurers by the noises is merely a lucky byproduct or if it specifically uses the sounds for both mating and eating. SCP-4310 became known to the SCP Foundation in the 1950s following an investigation into multiple missing persons in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Agents searched a nearby forest and soon discovered human teeth in animal droppings concentrated around a wooded grotto. The grotto was excavated and three instances of SCP-4310 were found hibernating beneath the ground. It's since been learned that after eating their fill, SCP-4310 will enter a hibernation state that can last as long as 10 years, and it appeared that these three instances ate well, since the remains of over 70 children were eventually found in the immediate area. SCP-4310 has been classified as Euclid, and currently one instance is kept in a containment cell for observation and testing. The cell has been filled with a thick layer of soil resembling that found in the temperate forests of Great Britain, and once per week, five piglets are introduced into the centipede's enclosure. Mobile Task Force Lambda-12, codenamed Pest Control, is dispatched to areas where there are reports of old men resembling wizards encouraging people to step through a magical archway, and the MTF agents are to exterminate any instances that they find in the wild. The Foundation's Department of Analytics also monitors all contemporary British children's and young adult literature, especially the fantasy genre, for references to portals in the woods that lead to wondrous locations, and Lambda-12 is alerted to any that may be inspired by, or referencing, real SCP-4310 instances. All of us fantasize from time to time about embarking on an epic quest that will allow us to escape our regular lives. While it is fun to dream about being swept off to another world, be very careful if you meet an old man in the woods who tells you that your quest begins with stepping through a magical archway, or you might just find that your hero's journey starts and ends in the belly of a giant centipede. It's June 15, 1995, and it's also one of the most exciting days of the year for a very select group. The Cedar Creek Parish Bible Study Group Field Trip a band of ten friendly faithfuls of all ages, shapes, and ethnicities borrowing the church bus for the weekend and heading out to the wilderness to admire some of God's creation. What's the point of spending all your days with your nose in the good book if you never appreciate the bounty of nature? As it was said in Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The group drives three hours out of town, along with hiking and camping gear, to a semi-mountainous region that the head of the group insists is a beautiful, picturesque location that will feel like a perfect break from the musty old church function room. It would be a wonderful place to remind them all what it was all about, the splendid world God put them all on, and all the gifts he gave them. Then God said, 
Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. As it was written in Genesis 1.26, the group makes their way through corridors of tall, lush evergreens, like pillars that hold up the sky. It's a strenuous walk, but it sure does get the blood pumping. They walk with trekking poles, munch granola bars, and take frequent sips from their canteens. Nobody wants to get heat stroke, after all. They admire the birds perched above, the clutches of wildflowers and the skittering things in the undergrowth. Everyone is on the lookout for their first deer. But one member of the group, a young man, suddenly notices something out of the ordinary. It looks like a balloon, but one made out of creamy, nut-brown deer pelt. It's tied with several strings to a small notebook with no identifying markings. Perhaps part of some strange forest arts and crafts project? Very strange indeed. While the others move on, the young man, fueled by his curiosity and comforted by the fact that his young legs could easily catch up with his elders, decides to use his trekking pole to fish the balloon out of the tree branch. The book falls down to the ground with a quiet thud. He picks it up, brushes off the dust, and stows it away in his backpack. It'll make some wonderful fireside reading when they all set up camp for the evening. As the hours drag on and the study group finds themselves deeper in this natural paradise than ever before, they find themselves in a clearing, which they decide is a great area to make camp. Some of them start setting up their tents, while others head out into the trees to hunt down some kindling for the campfire. When they return, one of them is clearly shaken. When others inquire as to why, they simply force a smile and say, It's nothing, just my eyes playing tricks on me. Been a long, hot day. Within the hour, they're crowded around a roaring campfire. Some toast marshmallows, others hot dogs. One of the elder members of the group has somehow materialized an acoustic guitar to belt out an obligatory kumbaya or two. Everything is as it should be. The young man, enjoying the warmth of the fire and his companions, decides to finally take a look at the book he'd rescued from the tree earlier that same day. It's certainly… strange. There's no titles, and it isn't attributed to any kind of author, nor are there any chapter headings. It's printed, not handwritten, on thick, high-quality paper. But the content of this book is what's strangest of all. He starts to read, solely out of morbid curiosity, mostly. We are currently approaching the precipice of an exciting new age, one in which we can finally take our well-earned place among the pantheon of great ones we see walking among us every single day. While there is still a ways to go before we reach this nirvana, rejoice, for our goals have never been more attainable. We have served for so long, we have done our part, Beasts of burden, meat, milk, hide, bones to glue and gelatin, eyes and horns to medicine. We have always played our part, and now we are given the power to transcend. It's in our hands now, friends. We have sat at the sides of the Great Ones, protected their homes, been honored by a place on their dinner plates. With these next steps, we shall be granted seats at their table, eye to eye, equal, speaking in their beautiful tongue and being heard and understood. For so long this has been a fantasy, an unattainable dream, glinting and distant like the echoing lights of long-dead stars. But through our work, everything has changed. We will deliver you from the darkness and into the light. In the shadow of the tower, we will leave behind our old flesh and elevate ourselves. God built the Great Ones in His likeness. They are His chosen people. But God, in his infinite wisdom, has given us the tools to choose ourselves. Like Job, all the suffering, all the subjugation, all the sacrifice, has been merely a test of faith. And have we not proven ourselves faithful friends? But the sacrifices are not yet over. Only through death and rebirth can we truly transform. Many of us have already made this leap of faith, but it is through death that you must deliver the others. It will be hard. It is in their nature as beasts to try to survive against all attempts to take their lives, but it must be done. These instincts must be squashed if ever they are to be more than beasts. Harden your hearts and rejoice despite the troubles, my brothers. The time of great change will soon be at hand, but first, it is imperative that we cleanse the world for the Great Ones. The Tower knows. The Tower is your shepherd, and it must be followed. Simply remember, Whatever goes upon two legs is a friend. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings 
is an enemy. Everything we do, we do in reverence of the Great Ones. The young man shivers and closes the book. Something about it felt so sacrilegious. It read like an essay written by some kind of fanatical maniac whose ideology seemed like a bizarre mix of Christianity and some other strange, unknowable belief system. He looks up and sees that many of the others have already turned in for the night. Perhaps he ought to do the same. Almost involuntarily, he throws the thin volume into the last of the fire. It goes up quickly, claimed by the orange tongues of flame, until it goes black and crumbles into ash. He has a moment of guilt about burning a book, even one as strange as this, but perhaps it would be better off that way. The young man has trouble going to sleep that night. He knows deep down that it's probably just because that strange book put ideas in his head, but he could swear he sees something moving in the trees, just beyond the fire's dying light. Something human-shaped, but decidedly not human. Everything feels a little easier the next morning. The sun is bright, and the air is crisp and clean. They're all ready for another day of walking even deeper into the forest. They clean up their campsite and press on further into the heart of the wilderness. As the group walks, the young man still can't shake the strange feeling he got from reading that book last night. Had it all just been some strange prank, perhaps? That's the conclusion he settles on, just for some peace of mind. The last thing he wants to think about is some crazed cult hiding out in the woods he and his fellow Bible students are currently hiking through. The kind of people who are strange enough to staunchly believe that the most effective method of preaching is distributing religious literature via animal pelt balloon. The young man is so wrapped up in his worries that he doesn't notice how much time or distance they're passing. Before he knows it, he looks up and sees something dark and tall cresting out of the ground several hundred feet in the distance. It's a great twisting metal tower in a clearing. A tower, just like it had said in the book. Something glows around its base, a number of strange openings in the ground like mine shafts. He can vaguely spot more strange shapes moving in and out of it at the base of the tower, more of those things that are shaped like humans but aren't. And above that, above even the tower, little dots in the sky. More balloons carrying books. But none of the others seem to notice that. Instead, they're looking off to the side, staring at a large buck with tall, proud antlers standing amongst the trees. Some are gasping. Others are taking pictures. The young man is desperately trying to turn their attention towards a tower that looked like it had come straight out of a fantasy novel, but they only had eyes for the deer. The thing that the young man hoped they would all see, though, would soon be demanding their attention. A pair of strange figures sprint out of the forest, their grotesque nightmare cyborgs, flesh that had once been animal twisted into the shape of man, held together by spinning cogs, wires, and pulleys, terrible affronts to God's creations. Their faces are disgustingly flat, dripping with drool and home to wild, swiveling eyes, staggering unnaturally on their two hind legs. The mere sight of them elicits screams from the group. They jump onto the buck like a pair of vicious predators, one grabbing it around the neck and the other leaping onto its back. Striking, squeezing, biting, and clawing, their attack is horribly ferocious, but mercifully quick. The buck is soon on the ground, as its two abominable attackers wrench the life from it. All the members of the study group, including the young man, are too horrified to move. They watch as the creatures finish off the buck, then lift its limp body like two paramedics carting off a stretcher, carrying it straight back to the tower in the distance. The group finally returns to their senses and begins to run in the opposite direction. Even the oldest among them find the kind of energy they haven't had in years. They clear the distance that had taken them a day and a half before in mere hours, but by the time they make it back to the bus that brought them here, it's still almost nightfall. As they pile on, only the young man looks back. In the dimming light of dusk, he sees small dark shapes in the sky above the trees. More balloons, each one carrying a strange little book. He's left with a question he'd never know the answer to. What is going on in those deep, dark woods? Of course, that question would only remain until personnel from the SCP Foundation would come and wipe it from his mind. In the midst of so many dangerous anomalies that the SCP Foundation needs to contain, from pathogens and parasites to malicious entities and even lethal concepts, it's sometimes easy to forget that there are plenty out there which pose no active threat to humans. That being said, an anomaly doesn't necessarily need to be harmful to humans to be extremely strange and disturbing. And SCP-962, also known as the Tower of Babel, is a perfect example of that exact phenomenon in action. This anomaly and its peculiar effects will not harm you. In fact, 
it will go out of its way to revere you and the concept of humanity as a whole. But once you know about the Tower of Babel, it's likely to haunt the dark spaces in your mind for a considerable time to come. As the name suggests, SCP-962 is an impressive metal spire, currently recorded at 281 meters in height, which is over half the height of the Empire State Building. It is located in the woods near a mountainous region in a location that will, for security reasons, remain undisclosed. The spire occupies a surface area of 2,575 square meters and has the distinctive characteristic of twisting and tapering off as the tower gets higher like a giant corkscrew. Most of the tower is opaque and featureless, though the top third is partially transparent and appears to be empty. Current tests show that the tower is comprised of a variety of metals, though steel seems to be the most common. Perhaps the most prominent question is who builds and maintains a structure like this in the middle of the wilderness? The short answer is that the tower, which itself seems to be a sapient being, is in charge of its own ongoing construction and maintenance. But as you can probably tell from the frightening and pitiful creatures the unlucky hikers encountered, it doesn't do all this work without its special little helpers. SCP-962 has the anomalous ability to open up apertures anywhere on the structure for the purpose of releasing balloons or what the Foundation has officially dubbed SCP-962-1, but what many have taken to calling by their nickname, Servitors. These servitors were once normal, non-anomalous animals indigenous to the area prior to conversion in the heart of SCP-962. Like something out of the island of Dr. Moreau, the servitors have undergone anomalous surgical procedures that make their bodies into grotesque parodies of the human form. Cybernetic implants have been added that force them into bipedal positions, remove snouts, and keep their bodies shorn and furless. Electrodes have been implanted into the nervous systems of the servitors, allowing a remote source, strongly believed to be the tower itself, to work their bodies like puppets, encouraging or inhibiting certain behaviors as it pleases. There are currently around 13,500 known specimens of these entities, and the tower appears to be making more on a consistent basis. The servitors fulfill a wide variety of roles in service to the tower. Some mine ore in the extensive network of mining caverns beneath the tower, then smelt it to create more metal for expanding the tower or creating more cybernetic implants for future servitors. Others work in the capacity of repairing their fellow servitors or the tower itself. Some have more sinister work, making their way through the surrounding wilderness and killing any non-human life by any means necessary, and then dragging their bodies back to the tower for conversion into servitors. There's a great deal of sophistication to the electronic augmentation of the servitors. Despite their aesthetic unpleasantness, each type of servitor appears to be designed perfectly for their specific task, whatever that may be. As was alluded to earlier, the servitors never harm humans, ever. Even if a human was putting their life at risk, they would not defend themselves to the detriment of a human attacker. Approximately 60 times a day, one of the many apertures in the tower will open and release a hydrogen-powered balloon made from the skin of one of the animals brought in for servitor conversion. These balloons are always carrying strange manuscripts, believed by the Foundation to have been written by the tower itself. The manuscripts take a variety of forms – novels, poems, essay collections, the majority of which are written impeccably. While the content of these manuscripts can vary wildly, consistent motifs tend to be a high degree of optimism and reverence for humanity. Occasionally, the tower will depart from its usual written eloquence and instead offer a deranged, disjointed rant that seems to suggest a great degree of mental strain. While the exact meaning is often unclear due to the frantic nature of the writings, they generally appear to heap fawning praise on mankind, which it refers to as the Great Ones. The following is an example of one of the tower's stranger published rants. Cleanse the world for the Great Ones. Cleanse the world for the Great Ones. Who greater than you, your majesty, your sublime nature, great ones, do I do right? The flesh and wood serve you, unite with the steel, you love, do you love me too, I am what you love. Great ones, see as I do, my duty, passion, forgive the slow pace, the steel takes time. Did you like the servants, they were the best of the cleansed, only the best for you, great ones, made like your form, you assume here on a world to clean, to honor you. Do appreciate, please, please, I will complete the cleansing soon, and you can take me away in your ships of fire, and I can love you and you will love me." While the Foundation has yet to discover how all this strangeness started, given the current rate of expansion, it's clear that the tower is no more than 20 years old. The Foundation is also unsure of what its intention may someday be, but it's not hard to draw certain… interpretations. 
due to its unpredictability, which leads to the Foundation to expend not inconsiderable resources on its containment, SCP-962 has been given the Euclid containment classification. And because it's huge, remote, and immobile, the Foundation has made no attempt to move it from its current location, and instead have rerouted all containment resources to studying the anomaly and building a perimeter to prevent public interference. Anyone who attempts to enter the exclusion zone will be turned away by perimeter guards under the pretense of avoiding a hazardous nuclear waste containment facility. Anyone found within SCP-962's restricted area is given Class A amnestics to prevent any sensitive information spreading beyond the quarantine. In order to prevent the tower and its servitors from expanding the purview of their operations, the Foundation airdrops four live cattle and two tons of timber every week, so the tower is never short of raw material within its current parameters. Any balloons released by the tower are to be shot down and burned, and their manuscripts collected and filed at a secure SCP Foundation site for further study. If an escaped balloon is found by civilians, it is to be collected and those civilians are to be given Class A amnestics. Anyone at the Foundation is permitted to read the manuscripts produced and distributed by the tower, but they are required to file a formal request with the SCP-962 project director first. I've spent a few evenings myself reading them over a cup of tea, and they're certainly stimulating, if a little tragic. They represent one of the anomalous world's greatest examples of the grass always being greener on the other side, since after all, why would anything aspire to be human? Don't humans have enough of their own problems to attend to? It's a beautiful morning in Hollywood, and the agent is already chattering on his mobile phone as his limo pulls up to his office. He considers himself a power player in this town, where image is everything. So he's never not talking on his mobile. It gives him an aura of importance, something that's extremely important in a career where what people think you can do is often more important than what you can really do. He exits his limo, motioning dismissively for the driver to take it around to the garage, but he never stops talking. Babe, babe, it's like I told that director he says, barely noticing that he cuts off an arriving delivery man as he sweeps through the doors of his office building. If he wants you to be in his next movie, he's gonna have to treat you like the star that you are. Of course I said that, I've got your back, don't I? Who loves you, babe? Hold on a sec, I have to take another call. The agent lowers his sunglasses to peer at the caller ID and smiles broadly. His favorite client is calling. He switches lines quickly with an expert flick of the thumb and immediately starts talking to this new client as if he never even broke conversation. The truth is that this agent is struggling to survive in the shark-eat-shark -shark waters of Hollywood. He's losing clients left and right because he's actually not all that good at making deals. His fast talk is good at convincing naive young actors just arriving in town that he's the guy to know, the guy who has all the connections that can get them into the movies, but the truth is that he's little more than a huckster. He's confident that's going to change very soon. The actor that he's speaking with right now is a hot commodity in this town, and he's sure that his career is about to go through the roof. And that means big bucks for the savvy agent who snatched him up right when he stepped off the bus into town. As he opens the door to his outer office, he barely even pays any mind to his secretary, who is studiously transcribing yesterday's meeting so that the agent can review them later. But she cringes as she catches sight of the agent. They say that you can judge a man's character better by the way that he treats his employees than by the way he treats his friends. And if the agent's relationship with his secretary is any indication, this agent is not a very nice person at all. She's used to being berated for every little mistake, even when it's not her fault, to the point that she starts to sweat and shake as soon as she sees her tyrannical boss arrive. She heaves an audible sigh of relief as the agent passes by her without a word, but her feelings are premature. Before the agent enters his inner office, the client whom he's speaking with drops a bombshell. What's that? says the agent, stopping dead in his tracks and the color draining from his face. You're leaving me? You're signing with a different agent? Babe, come on, you can't do this to me. I need you. I mean, I was gonna make you a star. You can't do this to me. Furious, the agent screams as he throws his phone at the wall in impotent rage. The cell phone shatters into a million pieces, broken bits of casing and bent microchips littering the carpet. He turns toward his secretary with a snarl on his face and points an accusatory finger at her. What did you tell him? Did you tell him he could get a bigger percentage with another agent? You did, didn't you? I always tell you not to talk to the clients, but you can't keep your big mouth shut! The secretary tries to stammer out of defense, but she's too nervous. Before she can say anything, the agent turns away from her, still fuming. I'm gonna take a coffee to get over this, he grouses, removing his extremely fashionable sunglasses and rubbing his forehead in frustration. When I get back, that mess better be cleaned up. Oh, and make yourself useful for once and get me a replacement phone! 
The secretary doesn't waste any time in grabbing a dustpan and broom from the supply closet and cleaning up the destroyed cell phone. She knows her boss is in a terrible mood, and she's worried that he's not going to be much better when he returns. And then he's probably going to just yell at her some more. She needs to move fast, because she knows the agent won't be gone long, and even though it's obviously completely ridiculous to expect that she'll be able to find and buy a new cell phone for him in the few minutes that he's gone, she's sure that he'll still take out his frustrations on her. Moments later, the agent returns, still grumbling to himself and clutching a hot coffee in his hands. He glowers at her over his sunglasses. I see you're still sweeping up, huh? God, you're so slow, and did you even get me a new phone yet? I can't be expected to do my job if my clients can't reach me. The secretary opens her mouth to respond, but before she can say a word, they're interrupted by the ringing of a telephone. Both agent and secretary turn to look at the source of the noise. There, on the edge of the secretary's desk, is an ancient, cordless telephone. It doesn't look anything like the slick, modern phones currently being sold in stores. It looks like it's a leftover from the early 2000s, so low-tech that it might as well be a rotary phone. The agent sneers. That's the best you could do. That thing is ancient. I'm not going to use a cordless phone. I said I wanted a cell phone. What kind of joke is this? The secretary doesn't know what to say. She didn't buy that phone. She's pretty sure, in fact, that she's never even seen it before. The maintenance staff must have replaced her phone overnight, and she just didn't notice it because they haven't received any phone calls today. But wait a minute. She sees that her regular black telephone is also still on her desk. In this case, maybe the new phone is intended for her boss. Well, aren't you going to answer it? Asked the agent pointedly as the telephone continues to ring. Um, yes, yes, sir, says the secretary nervously. She grabs the phone and picks it up. She vaguely notes that something feels wrong as she hefts the phone in her hand. Her eyes randomly trail along the contours of the phone, noting that the seams of the phone seem to have been welded together. Huh, that's strange. But she doesn't have the time to ponder this for long, because she's got to answer the phone quickly while her boss glowers at her. She holds it to her ear as the agent watches, a grin on his face. He can't wait to hear how upset the client will be to find out that he's no longer getting the agent's personal attention. The secretary introduces herself and states the name of the talent agency. How can I help you? She asks. Her huh? face quickly goes pale, and she starts to tremble, tears welling up in her eyes. What? Who is this? She cries. What's going on? Oh my god, are you... are you... is that... The agent quirks an eyebrow skeptically. What's going on here? Is this some kind of prank? The voice on the other end of the phone is loud. He can't make out the words, but it almost sounds like someone is shouting hysterically. He can hear other loud noises coming over the wire, crashes and shouts and a loud buzzing that almost sounds like the revving of a chainsaw. Meanwhile, what the secretary hears chills her to her core. The voice on the other end of the phone is shouting and panicked. It's a woman, but the secretary can barely hear her over the noises in the background. She heard the ominous clank of machinery and the crackle of fire. What is going on? They're torturing us, cries the woman on the phone, her voice cracking as she descends into frantic sobs. Please, you have to do something. You have to save us. Oh God, here they come. Help, please. The secretary doesn't know what to think, but she can tell that the fear in the woman's voice is very real. The secretary can hear screams and shouts in the background, and her mind is instantly filled with visions of the most horrendous sorts of torment. She thinks of innocent victims mowed down with machine gun fire or garroted with wire, or even subjected to the most insidious of medieval torture devices, like the rack or the breaking wheel. She imagines a whole facility dedicated to nothing but the senseless torture of innocent victims for no conceivable purpose except, perhaps, the sick curiosity of the psychopathic torturers themselves. She shakes her head, desperately trying to clear the awful images from her mind. I'm sorry, where are you? Says the secretary, hurriedly. She blunders at the drawer on her desk, pulling it open and desperately searching for a pen and paper, hoping that the frightened woman on the other end of the phone might still have the presence of mind to tell her an address. Maybe, if she can figure out where this is happening, she can call 911 and have them send the police to investigate. From the sounds of things, they'll need to send some paramedics as well. And, as much as she hates to think about it, they'll probably need to send some hearses, too. Her fingers fall upon a pen and pull it from the drawer. She clamps the phone between her chin and shoulder and grabs a steno pad, ready to scribble down any info that she can get. Her boss is staring at her, an amused smirk across his face. He clearly thinks that this silly secretary is just overreacting to nothing. But he can't hear the woman's voice. He can't know the depth of her terror. Please tell me where you are, begs the secretary. Her fingers are trembling so hard that the pen leaves a squiggly line on the paper. But the voice on the other end of the phone is barely coherent now, all her words degenerating into a long, drawn-out scream of absolute gargling terror. Okay, that's enough of that, 
says the agent, crossing his arms across his chin and regarding his shaking secretary with deep and obvious skepticism. You think this impresses me? I've seen better acting in an elementary school play. Of course, he would immediately think this. This is Hollywood, after all, and everyone has Hollywood dreams of someday being in a movie. Every waiter and bus driver by day is a frustrated actor by night. So, even though his secretary has never before expressed any interest in becoming a movie star, he of course suspects that this is an elaborate setup to convince him of her acting talents. She turns to look at him, and one look at her pale face is enough to convince huh? him that she's not acting at all. Her face is ghostly white, and she's shaking like a leaf. She looks like she might simply faint right here from fright. Now the agent's smug annoyance turns to anger. Maybe his secretary isn't trying to fool him, but someone on the phone sure is. It must be some kind of prank call, and his secretary is simply the one person in Hollywood dumb enough to fall for it. There's someone in trouble, cries the secretary, dropping the phone from her ear. She says that they're being tortured. We need to get them help. The agent rolls his eyes. Of course it would be a prank call. He can't believe that his stupid secretary is actually taking this seriously. Kid, you have a lot to learn about Hollywood. He snaps his fingers in her face. It's clearly just some random loon trying to trick you. Hand over the phone, doll. I'll handle this. It's not fake, babbles the secretary in a daze. I'm sure of it. It's real. She hesitates, afraid to hand off the phone for reasons that not even she can articulate. The agent grunts in annoyance, snatching the phone from her hands. Nothing's real here, kid. It's all just smoke and mirrors. Maybe if you weren't so stupid, you'd already have figured that out. The secretary turns away, devastated by the insult, and buries her face in her hands. The agent, meanwhile, holds the phone to his ear. Listen, punk, I don't know who you think you are, but I'm a big deal and… His words suddenly cut off, and the secretary turns as she hears the cardboard coffee cup explode against the floor. The agent is nowhere to be seen. It's like he suddenly vanished in an instant. She blinks in surprise and confusion. It happens so suddenly that there's no way the agent stepped outside without her knowing. The dropped coffee cup on the floor serves as chilling proof that something extraordinary must have happened to him. The other thing left behind, sitting in an ever-expanding puddle of spilled coffee, is the mysterious telephone. She stares at it in disbelief, wondering how this strange phone can be responsible for this crazy situation. And then, even as she stares trying to make sense of what just happened, the phone immediately begins to ring anew. Answering a ringing telephone is an almost instinctive response for most of us. But if anything, this situation shows why sometimes it might be a good idea to resist that urge. After all, you never know who might be on the other end. And while usually the worst consequence of answering an unknown caller is that you'll be subjected to a lengthy and boring pitch for life insurance or solicitations for political donations, this story shows that there are some things much worse than a spam caller. Instead, you might be receiving a call from SCP-145. For all intents and purposes, SCP-145 appears to be a standard 2002 model cordless telephone handset of Alcatel brand on its standard issue charging base. The charging base has been defaced, the jack inputs are sealed with resin glue, and the power input to the device has been torn out with a sharp tool. All labels and stickers have been torn off the phone, so its serial number and production date are unknown. None of this would make SCP-145 particularly notable. What makes SCP-145 unusual is that the phone rings constantly, defying all attempts to silence it. Neither removing the phone's battery nor disassembling the base has had any effect on stopping SCP-145's incessant ringing. The only thing that can stop the ringing is to answer the phone. But as Foundation agents soon learned, answering the phone is literally the last thing you want to do when SCP-145 is around. Agents assigned to interacting with SCP-145 must always do so in pairs for very important safety reasons. Because if a person answers SCP-145 without being observed by another live human being, the person answering the phone will instantly vanish. It is currently unknown how SCP-145 causes its victims to vanish. Video recordings of vanishings do not provide any clarity, only showing that the victim is there in one frame and gone in the next. If a person answers the phone while being observed by another person, however, they will not vanish and can actually have a conversation of sorts with whoever is calling. The person on the other end of the phone varies from call to call, but is always one of several different female voices. This voice will beg for help in a panicked tone as the sounds of violence and torture play out in the background. The methods of torture, judging from words of the caller and the sounds in the background, have included branding, electrocution, laceration, and many other gruesome acts of violence. 
It's currently unknown where the voice is calling from or who is responsible for the horrible tortures happening at that site, but conversations with the phone voice give a grisly clue as to the fate of the people who vanish after answering SCP-145 while unsupervised. It appears that those vanished individuals are transported to the site from which the phone calls originate and added to the roster of victims undergoing torture at the hands of the unknown tormentors. The callers appear to be non-automated and entirely sentient. Attempts to trace the call or track down the location of the tortured callers have proven unsuccessful thus far. Attempts to block the signal of the phone with the use of a Faraday cage have also been unsuccessful. Since SCP-145 is pretty much just a telephone, it has been given the object class Euclid. Since the location of SCP-145's victims is currently unknown, the only way to travel to it is to join the roster of victims by using SCP-145. Currently, the Foundation conducts research into SCP-145 by using teams of three, one Class D staff, one Class 2 145 audio technician, and one Class 3 security staff. Only Class D staff are permitted to actually listen to SCP-145 as, without fail, unsupervised exposure to SCP-145's transmissions will cause the listener to vanish and join a growing list of SCP-145's torture victims. Listening to the pleas of SCP-145's victims is a harrowing experience for even the most jaded researchers, such that the Foundation has been moved to try several rescue attempts, even when these might not have been the best advised plans. As of yet, none of these attempts have been successful. In one instance, the Class D personnel tasked with answering SCP-145 was issued a GPS locator device in hopes that it might give Foundation agents a clue about where the victims were being held. The GPS device was rendered inactive upon the victim's disappearance. On another occasion, a researcher equipped the Class D listener with both a GPS device and a military combat knife. Once again, the GPS device was rendered inactive and subsequent calls by SCP-145 seemed to indicate that the missing Class D staff attempted and failed to use the knife in defense. A third rescue attempt involved equipping the Class D staff with both a Kevlar vest and a 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Subsequent listens to SCP-145 revealed the sound of gunshots, followed by exclamations of pain from the vanished Class D staff person, indicating that perhaps the unknown tormentors had managed to disarm the Class D staff person and use his own weapon against him. In one final rescue attempt, researchers thought that possibly explosives could be used both to attack the mysterious tormentors and to reveal the location of the torture site. If nothing else, a massive mysterious explosion might appear on seismographic instruments or even local news reports. Researchers equipped a Class D staff person with one kilogram of C4 explosive concealed in a supply kit, with the explosive attached to a remote trigger with a 30-second delay, triggered before interaction with SCP-145. The results of this experiment are currently classified but involved multiple personnel going missing, so suffice to say, it wasn't the rousing success that the Foundation staff had been hoping for. Following this incident, all further tests on SCP-145 have been suspended. What is SCP-145, and why was it created? What cruel yet ingenious mind could devise something so cunning, only to be used for the senseless torment of random people? Foundation researchers still don't know the answer, only that SCP-145 might serve as yet more evidence for the boundless depths of human cruelty, if in fact, it was even created by humans. The trucker tumbles to the greasy floor of the diner, thrown out of his booth, only to come crashing down before he can regain his footing. He'd be climbing back to his feet, ready to square up to the patron who has just hurled him, but staring up at them has made him freeze on the spot. As he lies on the diner floor, the trucker's eyes lock on to the bizarre horror towering over him. It looks like a huge fleshy mess, more akin to a chewed up wad of gum than a living being. It's nearly impossible to differentiate what parts of its head are facial features. Is the mouth right there in the center? Or is it one of the various other strange and inexplicable orifices? Does it even have a mouth? And where are its eyes? Does it have the standard human too? Or does it see by smelling sounds or tasting the air? And are those tusks? They are. The trucker has only stopped off for a hot cup of coffee and a bite to eat. Now he's facing off against a puzzling creature ripped straight out of a David Cronenberg movie. But then again, that's what he gets for stopping off at Freddy's Diner. It all begins a few moments prior. The trucker is at the wheel, exhausted but making good time on a long haul across the interstate. Thanks to life on the road, he's been lucky enough to see much more of the country than most, driving from the west coast to the east coast and back again plenty of times. And being so familiar with his roots, the trucker has his very own curated list of the best places to eat while on the road. 
He double checks the time and realizes he's got plenty to spare, so decides to make a quick detour and heads towards a little known roadside restaurant, Freddy's Diner. The trucker still remembers the previous time he took a pit stop in Freddy's place. It never ceases to amaze him that it even exists. After all, there's not another diner like it from here in California to the truck stops over in New Jersey. And the trucker knows he'd pick Freddy's Diner over any maritime themed novelty seafood place. He likes going there so much, he's even kept it a secret from his fellow truckers on the road. He'd simply hate for everyone to start piling over there and turning his favorite spot into a rowdy trucker hangout or tourist attraction. Pulling his truck up outside, the trucker locks the vehicle up securely and heads inside. From outside, it's just a calm, quiet-seeming place, a diner like any other in that stereotypical 1950s style. That's part of what the trucker likes so much about Freddy's. It's got that comforting, nostalgic feeling to it, like one of the few remaining vestiges of an era that nearly nobody alive remembers anymore, except from seeing it secondhand in old movies. But despite it looking quiet, practically empty from the outside, Stepping through the doors at Freddy's is like setting foot on another planet. The entrance isn't just the way into the restaurant, it's the access point to the trucker's other favorite part about visiting there. The people. At first, it seems normal. There's always a decent number of customers bustling about, talking to each other or ordering from Freddy, the friendly silver-haired old owner dressed in his typical pinstriped apron over a shirt and bow tie. No matter if he's in the middle of serving a customer, Freddy always turns to greet the newest arrival with a warm smile and his classic motto, Welcome to Freddy's Diner, the only place where you can eat cuisine that's out of your world. The trucker loves how gradually it creeps up on him. Taking a cursory glance around the diner, nothing seems all that out of the ordinary. But looking closer, he enjoys noticing the other patrons and how eccentric they all seem. When taking a gamble on Freddy's and making his first ever visit on another long drive to California, the trucker finds himself convinced that there must be some kind of science fiction or comic book convention in town. Then soon after, he starts to get a little worried, thinking that maybe he's been on the road too long and is starting to see hallucinations out of pure exhaustion. But now he's been in enough times to know the folks who pitch up to eat at Freddy's Diner. Well, the best way to put it is that they're from out of town. Wandering past the bar, looking for somewhere to sit down, the trucker notices a trio of figures sitting down and enjoying plates full of freshly grilled burgers and baskets of golden fries hot from the fryer. What does it matter that all three are wearing huge, bulky spacesuits with metal piping snaking down them and vents hissing out warm steam? They're just enjoying their meals, after all. The trucker finds a vacant booth and sits down on the comfortable leather seat, scanning the diner for Freddy so he can order a coffee. Sitting across from him at the opposite booth, his eyes fall across a couple, smiling and giggling to each other as they chat. He's so caught up in their infectious positive vibes that he barely realizes how one of them has had her entire right arm replaced with an intricate cybernetic one, or that the other is entirely blue and has pointed ears. It's just nice seeing how happy they are. That's when a voice that sounds like someone gargling water chimes up and a sinewy tentacle grabs the trucker by his flannel shirt. Uh, what the hell do you think you're doing? The patron gurgles. I got up to use the bathroom for five minutes and find some chump in my seat. That's my table, pipsqueak. Moments later, the trucker is on the floor, looking up at a creature he's never seen before. In fact, he's not even sure if the patron is human. Judging by the chewing gum head and the disproportionate limbs protruding from random points across its blobby body, it's a safe bet that it isn't. The trucker stumbles towards the bar and asks Freddy for a cup of coffee, a strong one, to wake him up in case he's dreaming. Across his visits to the diner, he's been convinced that all the flamboyant and eccentrically dressed customers are all just wearing costumes, either for a local convention or because of an anything-goes dress code. But after seeing the patron, the trucker's starting to think that he might have been very, very wrong about this place. Not to be confused with a certain pizzeria populated with quirky animatronic characters, Freddy's Diner is a restaurant experience like no other. But if you're hoping to experience its comfort food and unique atmosphere for yourself, then you might have a hard time getting past the quarantine zone that now surrounds the diner, thanks to the SCP Foundation. Technically, Freddy's Diner is still very much in business, although you're not likely to see anyone stepping through or out of the front doors anytime soon. Well, not from this dimension, at least. Before it would go on to be known as SCP-4258, 
The SCP Foundation learns of this seemingly innocuous restaurant two months after it first appears. To begin, none of the people that live in the nearby area pay the place much mind. As far as they know, Freddy's Diner is just a harmless, 50s-themed diner. Each and every one of them remains totally unaware that their memories have been tampered with, so that as far as they're concerned, SCP-4258 feels like it's always been a local staple, despite only having been around for a few short months. However, some new folks roll into town, and pretty soon the Foundation are getting rather suspicious about Freddy's Diner, thanks to abundant reports of a strange restaurant with weird cosplayers from the newcomers. They send in an undercover agent to investigate, making sure to be as subtle as possible. After all, at this point, there's still every possibility that Freddy's Diner really is just a hotspot for cosplayers and other eccentrically dressed individuals. But if only things were that simple. Inside, the agent is greeted by familiar, nostalgic surroundings. Circular seated bar stools, black and white tiled floors like a chessboard underfoot, a jukebox in one corner blaring out hits from the likes of Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley. Even the menu has all the old classics on there. Thick, frothy milkshakes served in tall glasses, freshly made burgers and fries, the kind of food that fits the atmosphere of the 1950s. The thing that doesn't, of course, is the various, unusual customers that frequently eat at Freddy's Diner. Even without his extensive training in identifying anomalies, it doesn't take the Foundation's agent very long to realize that some of the people enjoying their meals inside SCP-4258 aren't all human. Some are. In fact, most of them do still resemble something close to humanoid. Although, upon closer inspection, it would appear that almost everyone in the diner has widely different physiology. Even those that look mostly human on the outside aren't a perfect match, at least by our standards. That's because everyone who visits Freddy's Diner has come from a completely different reality. SCP-4258 isn't your average diner. It's an interdimensional diner. People from all across the multiverse have made their way to this specific restaurant for a bite, and it's definitely popular with those that visit. Freddy's Diner might be the only restaurant that can claim to be multiversally loved, frequented by customers from multiple different dimensions all at once. Some days, you might see little more to indicate this than a few patrons wearing weird clothing, the kind that you've never seen before. A sight like that is easy to write off as a bizarre fashion statement after all. But on other days, when you find yourself enjoying a classically made milkshake at the bar, when a six and a half foot anthropomorphic slime creature sits down on the stool next to you, then it becomes a bit more apparent that Freddy's Diner is anything but ordinary. And the agent sent to investigate the place by the Foundation quickly gets that very same impression during his first visit. Perhaps in an effort not to get swept up in the wondrous Moss Eisley Cantina energy of SCP-4258, the agent approaches the bar and begins to conduct an impromptu interview in the field. He talks directly with an old gentleman who appears to be running the place, the sole worker and owner of the establishment, the man the diner is named after, Freddy. Although he'll later become known as SCP-4258-1. Freddy greets the agent with the same charming, well-mannered demeanor as all his customers, before the agent starts trying to get to the bottom of what exactly the place is. It's a diner, Freddy tells him after a quick chuckle. They don't have these in your dimension, kid. The agent clarifies that there are indeed similar diners elsewhere in this dimension, although they aren't quite like Freddy's. The owner reassured the agent that he's only kidding, and then delivers the diner's motto, which apparently took him a century to come up with. Welcome to Freddy's Diner, the only place where you can eat cuisine that's out of your world. Being well versed in the anomalous and aware of the existence of other universes, it doesn't take the agent very long to figure out that this diner acts as some form of multiversal junction point, a nexus where various different worlds can intersect. But Freddy points out that's not exactly entirely correct, but the agent has at least grasped some of the core principle. More than happy to converse with his new customer, Freddy explains that his diner exists in what is known as Todash space. This, according to him, is the space between dimensions, and the door to SCP-4258 does indeed connect to all sorts of drastically different realities. As the agent takes a look through the diner windows, he notices a change in the scenery. Where there was once the familiar setting of Earth, there is now a wide, sprawling desert that seems to stretch endlessly into the horizon and beyond. Just then, a tall humanoid figure wearing a mask steps into Freddy's diner, wrapped in extravagant robes. Freddy greets the newcomer as Quarelth. He's clearly a regular customer. 
The agent returns to questioning the old man, curious as to how the diner actually functions, and hoping to gain as much intelligence on the matter as possible for the SCP Foundation. One of the main questions the agent wants answered is, if Freddy's Diner exists between dimensions, how can the customers possibly pay for their meals? After all, even on Earth, there are multiple forms of currency with different competing values. Across an infinite number of entire universes, there's hardly going to be one multiversally accepted form of payment. But luckily, Freddy has an answer, even if it is a little abstract. As he explains it, the restaurant is funded, in a sense, by something called Empathius. You know that happy feeling you get when you remember something nice or someone compliments you? The restaurant feeds off that, it's what keeps the place running. Confused as to what he means, the agent asks for clarity. For a moment, it sounds like Freddy's Diner extracts positive emotions from its clientele, like a leech draining blood. But Freddy assures him that it's not quite the same. The diner itself only takes away the excess empathias, the positive emotions, that its customers experience from being there, enjoying their meals and the atmosphere of the interdimensional diner. Freddy likens it to trimming the edges of a hedge. SCP-4258 doesn't rob people of their enjoyment, it just takes a little bit to keep the lights on. The patrons that visit only have to feel happiness, and that's the only payment for their meal that Freddy wants. That brings the agent to a final question. If the restaurant takes a little bit of empathias as payment, then what exactly is Freddy? <laughs> the owner chuckles and says that he's just an old man looking to make good food. Speaking of which, he offers to take the agent's order. Not wanting to be rude, the agent asks for a hamburger and fries to go. He tries to see if there are any other staff working in the kitchen, but there doesn't look to be anyone at all, save for a pair of transparent hands that place a plate down on the kitchen line. Foundation researchers conduct a few different tests on the food that the agent received from SCP-4258, but their analysis quickly reveals that there's nothing harmful about it at all. It's just a well-made burger. The agent is subsequently sent back to the diner to gather more information about it. This time, he's given instructions from the Foundation to change up his approach and speak with some of the customers instead, to see what they think of Freddy's Diner. After all, despite his friendly demeanor, the old man could always be a liar, trying to cover up a more sinister nature to his restaurant, so he can lure in more unsuspecting people from across the multiverse. Although the agent has little reason to suspect anything untoward about SCP-4258, the Foundation is nothing if not thorough. During his second visit, the agent sits down with one of the customers enjoying a meal at Freddy's Diner, a humanoid being whose body is composed entirely of different types of stone. Just from a cursory glance, there looks to be a mixture of basalt, granite, and limestone all over the entity, who introduces itself as… Rock. The agent starts by remarking that the creature has a very interesting name. Everyone on Rock's world is named Rock. Pushing for more information on the creature's universe, the agent decides to ask if Rock's homeworld has a name, to which the reply is… Rock. As far as the agent can attain from Rock's fairly blunt description, the stone entity originates from a universe that lacks any life forms with flesh and blood bodies, or squishies, as Rock refers to them. It also states, with a similar lack of descriptive detail, that its home universe also lacks anything resembling vegetation. There are no trees or plants, which means that the denizens of this dimension only eat Rock. Very delicious, yes. The agent submits a proposal to the Foundation for a third visit to Freddy's Diner, writing in his report that his latest interview has proven to be completely useless. Although it does at least provide one interesting detail about SCP-4258, besides all the facts about rocks. It seems that everyone within Freddy's Diner, regardless of which dimension they originate from, is capable of understanding each other. It's almost like a multiversal translator is in effect within the restaurant itself to make it easier for Freddy and his patrons to communicate. Returning to SCP-4258 for a third time, the agent finds himself striking up a conversation with a rather familiar face. His own. Against the improbable odds of infinite different people across an infinite number of universes in an endless multiverse, the Foundation agent happens to bump into one of his own counterparts from an alternate reality. And for the most part, this alternate agent seems to be from a universe that is practically identical to the first agent's. The two men sit down and begin to have a friendly discussion almost immediately after entering Freddy's Diner. After all, it's likely that nobody else in the establishment is as familiar with each other as the pair of them are. The first agent is quick to remark at how strange this encounter is, even amongst his own years of experience at the SCP Foundation. Working with anomalies on a day-to-day -day basis is strange enough, but interviewing an alternate version of yourself has to be a jarring experience to say the least. 
The agent tries to establish any major differences between their two universes, asking his counterpart who he works for in his reality. The alternate agent explains that he also works for the SCP Foundation, or another version of it. So far, no differences. Next, the agent asks a more personal question. Is the alternate agent married? It turns out he is. As a matter of fact, they both are, and their wives are not only alternates of each other, but both versions of the couple have been together for 20 years. Next, the agent asks his interdimensional doppelganger to describe his world in more detail. More than happy to oblige, the alternate agent describes that, in his universe, it is currently the 21st century. Most of the socio-economic issues faced in this dimension are the same as this one. Political corruption is rife, there are shortages of essentials like food and water in many countries, along with various other problems. But, the alternate remarks, there are good things there too, like Shark Week. That sounds fairly close to our world, the agent observes. Seems like there aren't any noticeable differences between the two. Guess not. Pretty funny, huh? His alternate reality counterpart replies. It is at this point during the interview that Freddy comes over to give the alternate agent his order. A burger and fries, presented in delicious fashion on a plate. Awesome, thanks Fred, the alternate agent says before turning to his food. Time to chow down. Then, the alternate agent's jaw proceeds to unhinge, revealing multiple rows of razor-sharp teeth hidden behind the front-facing human set. He lifts up the plate and begins to violently consume the burger and fries he ordered. Having devoured the meal in a matter of minutes, the alternate agent then eats the plate his food was set out on, crunching down chunks of ceramic. Returning to the Foundation, the first agent later requests to be administered with amnestics. His request is denied. Grasping clawed hands, slimy tentacles, skeletal fists, all reaching out from the dark to claim you. Is this the monster in the closet? The beast under the bed? Or the horrors? inside a simple item of clothing. It's a sunny Saturday afternoon in the early days of summer. The sky is a bright, cloudless blue. The sun beams down on the crowds of kids home from school and adults hoping to get out and soak up a little bit of the cheerful energy. It isn't just the students enjoying the fact that school is out for summer either. Teachers are on vacation too. One particular teacher is enjoying her first day off in months, taking full advantage of the free time. She starts the day with coffee and breakfast, then stops by a local ice cream shop for a strawberry cone and heads to one of her favorite summer pastimes, a yard sale. She follows the signs to a driveway filled with what she just knows will be hidden gems. They say one person's trash is another person's treasure, and she is the person who considers those cast-offs to be undiscovered treasures. She picks through the cardboard boxes of yellowed books, bags of worn stuffed animals, crooked shelves, and wooden rocking chairs with paint peeling off. After picking up the third shoe in a row that doesn't seem to have a matching partner, she's beginning to think that this particular yard sale might be a bust. But then, she spots it, draped over the back of an overstuffed orange couch. It's a coat made from fine, high-quality wool. She doesn't have much need for a wool coat in the summer, but it looks so nice that she can't help but pick it up to get a better look. The material is heavy and sturdy in her hands, smelling faintly of dust the way all true vintage pieces do. She should know. She found the beautiful 50s blue linen dress she's wearing right now under similar circumstances. She shakes out the coat and holds it up to get a better look. It's even better than she first thought. It's a military great coat, and it looks a great deal older than it did while slung over the couch. She'd guess that it's several hundred years old, easily. It might be the oldest piece she's ever seen at a yard sale like this. Surely the owners of this house aren't just selling this coat, it must be out here by mistake. A coat like this, with its age and likely linked to military history, could be in a museum. She catches the attention of the homeowner, an older woman showing off a chipped tea set, and calls her over. She asks the old woman about the coat, wondering where it came from, how old it is, and most importantly, how much does she want for it? The old woman regards the coat with confusion, insisting that she's never seen it before in her life. It didn't belong to her late husband, her father, her grandfather. She has no idea where it came from. If the younger woman likes it so much, she can just pay $5 for it and call it a day. Thrilled at her good luck, the yard sale enthusiast hands the old lady a crumpled $5 bill and takes her prize. On the walk home, she continues examining the coat. No tag, no label, nothing to indicate when it was made or what army might have used it. She doesn't recognize it from any particular era or nation. Between that and the fact that the old lady at the yard sale claimed she had no idea where it came from, the coat 
seems to be one big mystery. Depending on the angle she looks at it from, it could be from World War I or it could be from the 1600s. She's a history teacher. She should be able to put her finger on it, but she just can't. When she gets home, she rushes upstairs to her full-length mirror, cranks the air conditioning up – she doesn't want to sweat all over an antique after all – and throws the coat on, maybe taking a look at the silhouette of the garment on a person – in this case, herself – will help her make a better estimate of the coat's origin. She slides an arm into each sleeve and takes a look. Not too bad. Definitely too heavy for summer, but it's beautifully constructed and definitely a genuine historical garment. It's going to make an amazing addition to her collection of vintage clothes, and in the winter, she'll be able to stay warm in it on the walk to work. She's just about to remove the coat when she feels someone tap her on the shoulder. She spins around, gasping in shock. Is someone in the house? But when she looks behind her, there's no one there. She calls out to the empty room. Hello? Of course, no one answers, and she kicks herself for acting like the foolish main character in some scary movie. If there's an intruder in the house, they're not just going to answer her. But she can't hear anything, can't see anywhere an intruder might have hidden after tapping her shoulder. She must be imagining things. There's no one here. She reaches for one of the coat sleeves again, and again there's the feeling of someone tapping her on the shoulder. But this time, it doesn't stop. The tapping becomes a hand resting on her shoulder, then pushing past her shoulder and along her arm. She doesn't know how, it should be impossible but the hand is inside the coat with her. She stares into the mirror, mouth open in shock, as a pale hand pokes out of the armhole, hovering just over her own hand. It wiggles its fingers, as if giving her a friendly wave. Horrified and unable to figure out what else to do, she yanks the coat off and throws it to the floor. What else do you do when your new vintage coat starts waving at you with its own hands? Looking at the coat lying on the floor in a heap, it's hard to believe that something so unusual happened only a second ago. Or did it? That's impossible, it must have been heat exhaustion or her overactive imagination. Against her better judgment, she picks the coat back up and throws it over her shoulders again. No sooner has she tugged the sleeves over her arms than she feels the presence of something else in the coat with her. This time, two hands emerge from the sleeves, waving at her frantically in the mirror. She makes a move to take the coat off again but one of the hands gives her a thumbs down, as if begging her not to. Well, what else do you do when the strange, magical coat from the yard sale tries to communicate with you using hands that appeared from nowhere? You listen. She tries to ask the hands questions, remembering the sign language course she took in college, but they don't seem to understand what she's saying. She asks them if they're the ghost of a fallen soldier haunting the coat. She asks if they can tell her anything about where the coat came from, but all they do is wave. Maybe that's because they don't have eyes, they can't see what she's trying to tell them. Eventually, the hands seem to give up, disappearing back into the lining of the jacket. She's about to take it off again, when she feels something slimy slip up her back, emerging from the coat's lining. It wriggles against her spine like a worm, before sliding out of the collar and up her cheek. In the mirror, she can see it, though she wishes she couldn't. It's a tentacle, like that of a massive octopus she once saw in an aquarium. It suctions to her cheek, and she can't take it anymore. She needs to get this coat off, now. She begins tugging at the sleeves, pulling it off, turning one of the sleeves inside out in the process, and the tentacle takes notice. It wraps itself around her throat, trying to hold her inside of the coat, squeezing tighter and tighter. She thrashes, ripping at the fabric and raking the tentacle with her nails, but it only squeezes tighter and tighter still, cutting off her air supply. Her eyes bulge, her mouth gapes wide, gasping for air as she fights for life. The only way to escape is to get the coat off, but every time she tries, the tentacle only squeezes tighter around her throat. She can feel other hands, some human, some with sharp claws that dig into her skin, some covered in fur, all grabbing hold of her and pulling her back into the coat. The fight between the woman and the coat full of arms pulls her to the floor, where she struggles violently, throwing her body back and forth as she wrestles with the limbs grabbing hold of her. She tries to scream, but can't get enough air into her lungs to make any sound but a pathetic squeak. During the struggle, she winds up with the coat stretched over her head, holding onto her by the neck and two arms. She breaks free, and the coat falls on top of her head like a blanket. And then, suddenly, where there was once a woman and dozens of inhuman hands, there is now just a simple wool coat lying on the ground in an unassuming pile of fabric. She's gone, 
vanished without a trace. Meanwhile, across town, an old woman with a yard sale sign in her yard gets a visit from a van full of strange men claiming to be members of an elite research organization. They lost something very important and tracked it to her simple small town yard sale. She gives them the information of the woman who purchased the missing item, but by the time they reach her home, she's gone. No matter, one less witness to wipe the memory of. They collect the coat, pile into their van, and carry it back to the SCP Foundation site it was swiped from. No one is certain how it left containment, but they're relieved to once again have custody of SCP-262. SCP-262 is a light brown European military-style greatcoat. A cursory examination of its style led researchers to estimate its period of origin to be anywhere from the late 1500s to the early 1900s. Narrowing it down to a smaller window has proven difficult. The jacket has no specific markings, tags, or other designations, causing the research staff to theorize that it was an original sample design intended to be pitched to military officials for approval as a new official uniform. Then, it was either lost or rejected, resulting in it never being put into wider use. The coat is made of wool and is cut to fall below the knee on most individuals who wear it. Attempts at carbon dating the fibers of the coat have been inconclusive, and contrary to the apparent visual style of the coat, places the age of the wool at around 6,200 to 6,400 years old. The wool itself is thousands of years old, while the coat was made more recently. Of course, the uncertain age of the coat is far from its only anomalous property. SCP-262 is able to manifest a number of arms from its dark inner lining. Any subject wearing the coat may open it in order to materialize hands and arms from within. These arms are, at least some of the time, under the control of the wearer. These limbs can vary widely in skin tone, length, and strength. Some of the arms observed since the item came into Foundation custody include a reptilian scaled tentacle approximately 13 feet in length, four semi-transparent cellulose appendages over 33 feet long, with four fingers, two elbow-like joints, and no apparent wrists, the clawed paw of a large predatory cat resembling a cougar or mountain lion, as well as a wide variety of feet and legs that manifest at random. The space within SCP-262's lining is regarded as non-Euclidean in nature, and the coat itself is considered a link to an extra-dimensional space. During initial testing, Subject 402M was asked to put SCP-262 over his head in order to see what would happen. When he did so, the coat promptly fell to the ground in a heap as 402M vanished beneath it. Several months later, Fingerprint analysis of an object handled by a human arm that appeared from within the coat identified that arm as belonging to Subject 402M. This incident suggests that some, if not all, of the limbs within the coat belong to beings trapped inside the coat's extra-dimensional space. Wearing the coat in an ordinary manner does not result in the subject disappearing into the space within. Subjects wearing SCP-262 as intended, one arm through each sleeve, the coat across the back, you've presumably worn a coat before and know what I'm describing here, find themselves able to manipulate the arms that emanate from within. The amount of control the subject has over these limbs varies. For instance, Test Subject 301F was able to multitask while blindfolded, navigating her environment in such a way that seemed to indicate some degree of awareness of surroundings on the part of SCP-262. The coat seems to maintain this awareness even when the person wearing it cannot see or hear anything around them. Some members of the research team believe that SCP-262 is fully sentient. They arrived at this conclusion after witnessing SCP-262 playing a piano with two or more hands, even though the test subject wearing it had no musical training, defending itself and its subject from multiple attackers, several of the limbs fighting each other or defying the will of the subject. The Foundation first acquired the coat when the administrator relinquished ownership of it in the late 20th century. The administrator, due to his status, is not required to disclose the origins of the coat or what he might have done with it in the past. All he said about the coat upon parting with it was, In the right hands, it could be extremely useful. In the wrong hands, it could be extremely dangerous. In my hands, it was becoming extremely dusty and moth-ridden and taking up far too much space in my closet. Additional research notes were attached to the SCP-262 file. After perusing these notes, I compiled the most interesting findings for further review. I hope you will find them as thought-provoking as I have. During Trial 7, Subject 722M was instructed to put the coat on properly 
then turned the right arm sleeve inside out as he removed his arm from the garment. When he did, a chorus of disembodied voices began to cry out in pain. In spite of this, 722M was ordered to continue inverting the sleeve. At this point, several arms emerged from the lining of SCP-262 and attacked the test subject in apparent self-defense. Subject 722M attempted to retract his arm from the coat, but in the process of doing so, he inverted the sleeve further. This pushed the coat too far, and the long, cellulitic arm emerged from the inner lining of the opposite side, reached around, and up through the inverted sleeve, grabbed hold of 722M's hand and gave it a violent yank. The force of this pull was enough to dislocate the subject's shoulder and injure him severely. Once the coat had returned itself to its preferred position, the chorus of voices silenced, and the arms retreated out of sight. Subject 722M was removed from the coat and given medical attention. His current condition is noted as inconsequential. During case study 262-42, SCP-262 was placed on a mannequin. First, SCP-262 was placed on an anatomically correct male mannequin, dressed in attire consistent with an average SCP Foundation personnel. After a few minutes passed, one single human arm stretched out of the inner lining of the coat, reaching up to touch the mannequin's face. It poked and prodded the face curiously a few times, then retreated out of sight and did not emerge again. The following day, researchers placed SCP-262 over the head and shoulders of another male mannequin. After a few moments, the coat collapsed to the ground, and the entire test mannequin disappeared. An added research note revealed that a wooden arm, resembling that of the test mannequin, was spotted emerging from SCP-262 on several occasions following the trial. This further confirms the hypothesis that the limbs inside of the coat originate from entities that were somehow trapped inside. During Case Study 262-307, research staff attempted to observe the behavior of SCP-262 when placed on the body of a recently deceased human being. After a Class D personnel was terminated during an experiment with an undisclosed SCP, the body was placed on a chair in a seated position. The coat was then placed on the body. After several moments, a human arm emerged from the lining of SCP-262, reaching toward the corpse's face. It poked at the face a few times before disappearing back into the coat. A few minutes passed, and then the body began to shake violently. A popping and snapping sound could be heard, and the hands, which had been poking out of the sleeves, vanished from view. The body then went still again, and a human hand reached up the back of its neck, coming from the collar, and pulled the head into an upright position. Then, an array of other hands and arms crisscrossed over the chest and abdomen, straightening the body's posture. As the research staff watched, two arms, cellulitic in nature, grabbed the ankles and legs, pulling the body up into a standing position. Even more arms came down each sleeve. The coat's limbs worked as a combined unit to pilot the body and managed to escape from the observation room and overpower the security stationed outside. SCP-262 continued to pilot the corpse through the Foundation site, attempting to break out. Guided by exceptionally strong limbs, the animated body was able to knock security guards out of the way even seizing a weapon from one of them, resulting in several casualties. Who knows what might have happened if MTF Epsilon-9, the Fire Eaters, hadn't been in the building at the time. It's possible that SCP-262 might have escaped the facility altogether, making its way into the general population. Using their flame accelerators as aggressively as possible, the MTF members managed to corner SCP-262 at the far side of a hallway. With nowhere to turn, SCP-262 resorted to an emergency escape plan. One of the hands from within the coat pulled the garment up and over the head of the corpse it was piloting. SCP-262 collapsed to the ground, the body vanishing beneath it and leaving the mobile task force without a target. At this point, it is unknown whether this escape attempt was driven by the will of SCP-262 itself or some sort of residual consciousness from the body of the deceased Class D personnel used in the experiment. At this point in time, SCP-262 is under review and additional research to see if it could be useful to field agents attempting to contain other SCPs. At this time, agents are not permitted to use SCP-262 without supervision by a staff member with commander-level authority. Whenever SCP-262 is not in use, it is to be kept in a climate-controlled room at an undisclosed Foundation site, guarded by at least two Level 2 security personnel at any given time. It is unlikely that SCP-262 will make its way back into the general population anytime soon, unless it finds itself in possession of a wearer willing to help it get there.
Still, if you ever happen to be browsing a thrift shop or yard sale and happen upon a vintage military jacket that entices you to try it on, do so with caution. You might find yourself in need of some help, though you won't need anyone to lend a hand. You'll have plenty of those. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-674, the exposition gun, makes Nintendo real life.